Half a day, everyone. Welcome to the Guam Congress building. The Committee on Land, Justice, and Culture is now called to order. This is a joint. Um, this is a joint hearing conducted by the Committee on Health, Land, Justice, and Culture, the Committee on Public Safety, and the Committee on the Environment. It's now Monday, July 17, 2023, and the time is 5.35 p.m. Notices for this town hall were sent by email to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets on Monday, July 10, and again on Friday, July 14. Notice was also published in the Guam Daily Post on Monday, July 10th and Friday, July 14th. This hearing is being live streamed on, on the Guam Legislature's YouTube channel. The town hall is hosted by myself, Speaker Therese Terlahi, Senator Chris Barnett, Senator Sabina Paris, and of course we've invited all the senators to be here with us, and we've received technical help, of course, from all of our staffs, and I want to thank them for their assistance. Individuals testifying shall first be recognized, and please uh, state your name because these are being transcribed, and it always helps when you state your name so we know who's speaking when, when they're transcribing it. So we're going to try um, to be as efficient as possible because we, there are several of you who want to testify, but I want to allow the senators to ask some questions, so we're going to take a panel by panel and ask the senators to ask questions of that panel before they leave. And however, I'm gonna ask the senators to please um, limit your questions and answers to those questions to about five minutes so that we can get through that panel. And if there are additional questions for these people, we'll just, just let them know and they will hopefully be able to stay and come back after we've heard from everybody. Senators, if you would uh, cooperate with that, I appreciate it very much at least as close to that as we can. All right, so we've got one agenda item, that is a town hall on Department of Defense's proposed 360 degree enhanced integrated air and missile defense system, E-I-A-M-D-S in Guam. Of course, I wanna thank my colleagues for being here, beginning with Senator Barnett, Senator Tello Taitigui, Senator Joseph Augustine, Senator Jesse Luhan, Sizus Masi colleagues. We're also honored by the presence of our former Congressman, Robert Underwood, thank you very much, and former Senators, Carlotta Leon Guerrero, and uh, many agency heads. So I want to thank all of you agency directors for being here and, and all of the public who are here to testify as well. All right, so the purpose of this town hall, I'm just gonna, we're just going, I'm just gonna give a very brief opening statement uh, and then allow Senator Barnett also and Senator Paris. Um, the purpose in, of this town hall is to highlight information regarding the 360 degree EIAM DS or the system and the gaps in information that are necessary for the government and for the public to pose appropriate questions and concerns in addition to submitting effective comments for the public scoping periods that are upcoming. We want to hear from our local agencies so that everything can be put in front of the public. They are aware of what is happening with the agencies, between the agencies perhaps, and, and the uh, Department of Defense. If anything, we want that to be transparent and, and uh, something that all the public is aware of as we go along. I want to protect the government of Guam's bargaining or negotiating power and the upcoming, if there are any negotiations that will take place regarding these missile defense systems. So we want to support that. I think we've learned from past um, projects on Guam 
that without complete details during the scoping or the draft EIS or the final EIS periods, Guam's leaders and the public cannot effectively prevent the adverse impacts to health, safety, environment, land, culture that result from these projects. So we're trying to ensure that those mistakes do not happen and that we, among ourselves, can share the information that we have obtained or that we can think through and uh, share some strategies if, if that will help us as well. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Senator Sabina Paris. Thank you, Senator. All right, Senator Barnett. Thank, thank you, Madam uh, Speaker. I, too, agree that uh, I'm very encouraged and uh, hopeful from the communication uh, that I've had with government agencies so far, and it looks like we have an opportunity to uh, engage and speak in this conversation, uh, hopefully from uh, a ground zero, no pun intended, uh, point of view. Uh, I think that the speaker's right that there are a lot of um, instances uh, that we can take from the past, and not just the past, but the very recent past, where we've... Uh, not spoken with one voice, and it's uh, led to division in our community and ultimately uh, the government of Guam negotiating from a, a weak point. And so I look forward to the conversation and uh, also to learning more information about uh, what will it take um, for this missile defense system, uh, how it will defend Guam, if it will defend Guam, and uh, all the relevant questions that uh, I hope uh, we can get answers to tonight and moving forward. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator Barnett. Senator Pierce. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for um, organizing this joint hearing. Uh, I think it's really critical that, for, first of all, I want to thank all the agencies that showed, showed up here today. Uh, it's important that uh, we're all uh, here, at the, uh, here getting, gaining information about this, what's called as the next military buildup, right? And uh, as we know in the past, there have been many environmental impacts, and unfortunately, we, we, we address them at the tail end rather than at the front end. And so I'm very, uh, it's promising to see every, everyone here today. Um, hopefully we get the full scope uh, and hopefully we can get all the agencies involved in learning exactly what is at stake uh, with this buildup, additional buildup. And um, we also want to make sure the public is aware because a lot of these, uh, a lot of this information is hidden, it's inaccessible. Uh, whether inaccessible through a website or inaccessible because the jargon that's put out and the volumes of information that's put out uh, and the different sources of information that we have to look up to in order to fully understand uh, what are the true impacts. And so, um, you know, consider this as our first convening of a, a very important uh, uh, informational gathering session and um, we hope to, you know, work as a community moving forward. Sutus Masi. Sutus Masi, Senator Paris. All right. Um, so we're going to try to get uh, everyone who's also listening to this live stream on the same page very quickly. I know we've got uh, more experts than me in the room, so, but I'm going to just uh, highlight with a, some, a few slides the information that has been publicly made available to us. All right, if we could begin the first slide. All of these are available uh, from our office on a drive, and these are actually, a lot of these are from the materials that have been distributed by the Department of Defense. Next slide. Next slide. All right, um, this slide is pretty much what is this um, 360 degree enhanced integrated air and missile defense system. I'm going, to recall, I'm going to refer to it throughout the hearing as the missile defense system for short. 
Uh, its purpose is to defend the entirety of Guam against the rapidly evolving threats of advanced cruise, ballistic, and hypersonic missile attacks from regional adversaries. MDA and the Army need to strategically locate and integrate various system components, including a command and control center, radars, sensors, missile launchers, missile interceptors, and support facilities at multiple sites around Guam. Next slide. These are the agencies that are involved with this process. Missile Defense Agency, Army, Navy, Air Force, and the FAA. Next slide. The NEPA process, National Environmental Policy Act, we're gonna to refer to this as NEPA throughout the hearing. This is the process that includes a scoping period. Sorry, that's so small, I can see it now. Scoping period, and then they will come out with a draft EIS. When we receive the draft EIS, we will have 45 days to make comment. After that, they will produce a final EIS and a public review period and then they will make a decision, or, and that's called a record of decision, and that would close the NEPA process. They've announced that they intend in the NEPA process to also um, review the historic, the NHPA, National Historic Properties, uh, during that same process. So right now, next slide, we're in the scoping period. They are asking for comments on Identifying, identifying, defining, and prioritizing issues to be evaluated in the EIS, the Environmental Impact Statement. Next slide. All right, this is just the notice. So um, these notices were issued, and these meetings have changed, and the comment period deadlines have changed. So I just want everybody to not be confused. Hopefully, this is less co not co confusing, but. So the, the Department of Defense has issued um, changes. Um, the original deadline was June 27. It's, it moved to August 11. It's moved again to August 18. That's the deadline for comments. And these scoping meetings will now take place. Next slide, please. Now take place. Uh, that doesn't show. The new scoping meetings are set for August 2, 3, and 4. There they are. All right. At the scoping meetings, you'll be able to go. There will be no um, verbal presentations except uh, maybe one-on-ones. There will be uh, displays put up, and you can review the displays there, and they will have a place for you to submit comments as well. You can also submit your comments online. All right, next uh, slide. Next slide. All right, I think the most important part of what we've learned, it's very little, but they've dis established that 20 sites have been selected based on extensive siting studies to confirm alternative site selection, optimize system performance, and optimize facility planning and design. And so uh, these sites were also um, placed all around Guam in the event where Department of Defense property is not available to strategically locate the components on DOD properties or where buffer and safety zone arcs encroach on non-federal properties, acquisition of appropriate real estate interests on non-federal property may be needed in a few areas. All right, next slide. Oh, go back to that slide. Are you able to zoom in on the map? All right, so these are also available on social media. You can look at these. I think it was printed in the PDN. I just want to show that, so not all of the properties listed are on uh, military sites or installations right now. For example, there's a site down there in Malesu. Yes, thank you. Next slide.
Next slide. All right, this is just talking about the components that I talked about earlier, radars and sensors, and it, it, it gives a little description of them. Uh, I'm not going to read that to you now, but the radars and sensors, the command and control center and the launchers. Next slide. The launchers are combined expected capabilities include utilization for ballistic, hypersonic, and cruise missile defense. All right, these are associated support facilities are also involved, including power plants, fuel storage facilities, and water storage facilities. They call life support facilities, family housing, fire stations, and dining. These would also be constructed and operated on these sites to support the components and the personnel. Next slide. So contracting notices for the system have already been published despite uh, only being in the project scoping period. Both of the contracts listed were published in June 2023, last month. The first contract's description states, the work includes the following and related incidental work for the construction of an initial deployment capability at Northwest Field, Anderson Air Force Base, Guam. That contract notice offered a one-time pre-proposal site visit for contractors and is planned for August 4, 2023. The second contract's description states, this procurement will result in a in one indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, or IDIQ contract for multidiscipline architect engineer services for missile defense system projects and other projects at various locations under the cognizance of Naval Facilities Engineering Systems Command Pacific, but may also include worldwide. Ballistic information on the 360 EIAMD system and Sorry, on the missile, ballistic missile defense system projects with specialized facility requirements may be included in this IDIQ. Next slide. There are several mentions of the, this uh, EIAMD system, the missile defense system and the National Defense Authorization Act. This is the budget for the military, pretty much. It is passed by Congress every year. So in the House bill, they talk about uh, Missile Defense Agency major equipment. The House agreed on providing 169,627 for defense of Guam procurement. Senate bill designates the Under Secretary of Defense for acquisition and sustainment as the principal DOD official responsible for the acquisition of a system for the Missile Defense of Guam. Next slide. A 2018 Army G4 report listed Guam as a potential location candidate for micro-reactor installation. This was also published in the news. The National Defense Authorization Act Executive Summary published by the Senate on uh, Committee on Armed Services in June 2023, I quote, directs a briefing on the status of the development of nuclear micro-reactors and plans to transition such capabilities to the services for production as well as a briefing on the potential for using modular micro-reactors to supplement power generation in Guam, unquote. Next slide. This is a timeline that was provided by DOD detailing um, the process for these setting up of the missile defense. It shows, um, are we able to zoom on that? It shows, um, 2023 system requirements review. There, you can see it. Preliminary design review, 2024. Initial deployment, 2025. Sometime between, or right, uh, they say in early spring 2024, they are expecting to have the draft EIS completed. And then again, we will have 45 days for comments. So they predict that to be early spring. Um, if you can go to the next part of that timeline. Yeah, thank you. 
It, in 2025, it notes that there will be a deployment of the initial capability for integration and testing. And that's before the final EIS is done. Keep going. Yeah. The final, sorry, the final is slated for 2025 as well. Do you see it on the top? Yeah, there it is. So in 2025, they're going to, they're going to deploy the initial capability and, and for integration and testing, and then they're going to do the final EIS right after that. All right, thank you. Next slide. So this goes from 2023 to 2030, and that activated in 2027. All right. That's it. Those are the basics, the very, very basics. And again, this material is available, some of it from the newspaper, some of it we can hand it to you, and, and we can. it's also available online, and we will have it on our, our website as well, or from any of the senator's offices. All right. Um, so again, we've invited the agencies, and I'd like to begin, and thank you for coming, with um, former Senator Carlotta Leon Guerrero. She is the governor's chief advisor on military and regional affairs, and also Vera Tapasna, who is the community defense liaison office. She's the executive director. Please proceed. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Madam Speaker and uh, senators. It's an honor to be here. I think this is a valuable forum, and I'm looking forward to all of the uh, discussion. Um, where we are right now is we are preparing scoping comments. And to give you an idea, the government of Guam has been here before. The last time um, when we had to put together scoping com comments for the, uh, well, it wasn't the last time, but the big one was for the Marine base. And many of the people that are on the team at that time are still on the team. Myself, uh, Vera, Joe Borja, Banji, Lujan, Carlo Branch, and, um, and then many of the people from other different uh, agencies. So we have some experience in doing this. I took a look at um, what we did the last time. In, uh, the, there was a civilian military task force, a CMTF, and we submitted scoping comments in May of 2007. And the way we got to those scoping comments, we had 11 subcommittees, and each of those subcommittees, they were broken down into environment, land, economic, uh, different health, education, different categories, and each one of those committees had as many as 20 members on there. Uh, members of the private sector, as well as from government agencies. So we knew that in order to move fast, and everything about being put into these processes pushes you fast, faster than you want to go. So in order to go fast and have um, expansive and extensive comments, we had put together the subcommittees, and then they started working on it and coming up with comments. So when we submitted, and we have 62 pages just from the CMTF. And then the government agencies also submitted comments separate and apart. But this is just from what the private sector, the activists the, uh, um, put together working with the government agencies. So we came up with 62 pages of comments that were submitted. This is a foundational document for us now. Um, and those, to have had um, when you add up those subject matter experts, if you had 11 committees and as many as 20 people on each one crunching it. And what we told them is we don't, we're, we were never satis satisfied with the amount of information that we had now. I don't think anybody in the history of the world going into a NEPA scoping process has ever said I've got everything I need. So, um, so what we did is we did the best that we could. We said, imagine every single scenario that you can possibly come up with. What are you concerned about? And put that down. And so we've got uh, those subcommittees tackled everything from erosion control, stormwater management, the impact you're going to have on the hospitals, the schools. They even touched on uh, how they felt about um, nuclear issues, radiation, pesticides. It's, it's, it was. Um, something that we did 
and we are using this right now. Vera sent this around to all of the different agencies to take another look at, dive deeper in, and to update it. So I just wanted to give you an idea of where we are. And this process that we are in, we, what ended up happening, working the way that we were all working together, um, by the time the, it came to the EIS, we responded to the EIS. And the sort of thing that we did to respond to the EIS, to give you an idea, is um, we took all the student council kids from the high schools. We decided we were going after 18-year-olds that could comment on the EIS. So we brought them all together. We taught them uh, what the process were, was, and we raised our concerns. And then we followed them into their high schools. And we were with them when they gave presentations and we took comments right there at the high school. We got 900 comments at the high school. We did a telethon with PBS with all of the chairs doing these roundtable discussions. We had like 30 people with phones taking in comments. And we got about 1,300 comments there. The government agencies kicked in about 4,300 comments. We were in the newspapers and then I know that uh, um, the activist groups also were kicking in their, their different groups that they have across the country. So um, we shaped it. What ended up happening is a four-year time frame got stretched by 12 years. Uh, uh, the initial marine buildup got uh, reduced from 15 billion down to 8.7. 8,000 Marines got dropped down to five. So it just shows in the process, working aggressively and comprehensively in the process, we, had, uh, we were able to reduce it and stretch it out and make it more manageable. So um, we are committed to doing that again, the government agencies, and now we know more about it, and we've got foundational documents. So that is, um, to give you an idea of what's what, what our plan is, what we're working on going forward. And to give you some assurances that um, we have been here before and we have been successful in reducing and shaping it. And we expect to be able to also, with due diligence, look at all the information that's gonna be presented to us and respond in a very pro-Guam, aggressive way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Carlotta. I'd like to also acknowledge the presence of Senator Joanne Brown, Senator Roy Kanata, and former Senator Tom Atta. Thank you for being here. All right, uh, Vera, please proceed, Mrs. Boss. Thank you and good evening. And um, it's an honor to be here as well. Um, and I think just, uh, I think Senator Carlotta uh, really expounded on uh, the efforts that are in place today with the government agencies and the, my office um, has been tasked to help facilitate the responses uh, from all the GovGuam agencies. So we have established the executive committee, the subcommittees um, that will involve all of the government agencies. Um, and we've had several meetings in terms of how we want to respond. Um, and as the Senator mentioned, um, we have given uh, all of the agency heads as much information as possible um, to include the prior civilian military task force responses and work that they had done through the marine realignment. And by doing so, um, we really touch on the NEPA process and looking back at past um, activities um, as part of the cumulative impact review, so past, present, and then any future um, um, growth initiatives by the military. So um, we are aggressively um, working on this and, and we'll be meeting with our, our agency heads um, and uh, certainly uh, possibly expanding that. But I think that, um, I do wanna say that um, there are three key elements that we, wanna, that we will be looking at and that is obviously with NEPA, it's the environment uh, the social, um, economic, um, um, uh, and, and then also governance, um, and what are those policies and, policies and procedures uh, that we will need to either implement or uh, amend to help our government agencies um, as they continue with their public service um, um, 
and more importantly, on, in the regulatory agencies like Guam EPA. So um, that's where we are today and certainly um, available for any, any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, Mr. Posnick, uh, your office is titled the Community Defense Liaison Office. Correct. Can you, do you mind just telling a little bit what, what your office is responsible for, for those who are not that familiar like me? Well, as you know, that the office um, has been in existence since 2007 or 8, and it was then called the Build-Up Office. Um, and then the name changed two years ago. Um, but at, for the last 14 years, it was um, a lot of the focus was on the marine realignment. And we had realized um, as a team that, you know, the Department of Defense, um, not just the marine realignment, that, but that they exist here, and it's not just the Marines. You have the Navy, the Air Force, the Army, and the National Guard who gets called upon, um, you know, on active orders. And so, um, and what we wanted to do was to really be the liaison office helping, um, you know, the, the, our colleagues um, within the, the agencies uh, to, you um, communicate or to establish these relationships directly so that they um, uh, can get the information that they need from the Department of Defense and really to look at um, and implement uh, community initiatives uh, that really serve uh, the greater good and, and um, how to build upon those relationships with the existing um, military uh, here on Guam. Um, so, that's thank you. All right. Um, we also have um, Lola Leon Guerrero from the Bureau of Statistics and Plans. Lola. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, actually, it's good evening. Thank you. Um, I'm honored to be here. Um, as Vera and Carlotta mentioned, BSP is actually part of the committee that was formed. Uh, that's under the lead with Vera. So we're here to provide, uh, uh, to support the, the office on any type of reviews, uh, especially when it comes to the federal consistency. And so right now, the information we have is just the information that has been posted on the website. So currently, the federal consistency planner, as well as the administrator at BSP, as well as myself, we're just kind of reviewing the information that's there and we're just waiting for, and then of course, we're gonna be attending the scoping meeting. So if there's any questions that you wanna ask, I can see if I can provide a response to that. Thank you. Thank you. Director Borja, did you wanna test, testify as well? <clears throat> Joseph Borja, Director of uh, Land Management, and uh, I'm basically here to answer those questions that you sent me, uh, Speaker. Uh, of course, Land Management uh, has purview over uh, land use in the private sector and uh, we do have information of course on uh, the uh, lands in Guam for the most part. If you could answer the questions that this is a good time. So there were several agencies that I sent some questions to including um, um, yeah so thank you. Okay, um, number one was, has DLM been in contact with federal officials about any of the candidate sites for the 360, um, what did you call it? Uh, missile defense missile, system. Missile defense system. And uh, no, we have not been in contact with any of federal officials about any of the candidate sites, the 20 sites. The second question that you have is, uh, are you aware of any non-federal properties that are being considered for the 360 degree uh, missile defense system? Uh, no, I'm not aware of any non-federal properties that are being considered for the uh, system. Number three, can you speak to any, and I'm assuming you would be a land management, to any land and housing issues under DLM's purview that may be affected if the DOD purchases non-federal land in Guam in use, to use for the uh, missile defense system. 
uh, know until we know which, if any, non-federal lands You want me to start over? Okay, I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, can you speak to any land and housing issues under DLM's purview that may be affected if the DOD purchases non-federal land in Guam to use for the 360 uh, missile defense system? No, until land management knows which, if any, non-federal lands uh, they want to purchase, uh, then we might be able to uh, speak to any land or housing issues uh, on that. And of course, those sites are um, all over the island. Number four, what is your understanding of the size of the plots that would be cleared for the missile defense systems identified uh, candidate sites? Um, the speaker and the uh, uh, committee chairman, uh, senators, I don't have any information on the size of each of those uh, sites. Uh, what I do know, looking at the map, and uh, this is a planning map, it's not, of course, survey accurate, is that um, uh, it looks like 19 of the sites are on uh, uh, federal property now, existing basis, and uh, the one site, as you mentioned, is down in, uh, in uh, Maleso, or it says Maleso. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Director. We also received, uh, I also invited, of course, the Admiral and um, sent him some questions uh, asking for additional information. Uh, so, Rear Admiral Huffman. And I just want to read very quickly his response so that we're aware. Uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you for your invitation of July 6, 2023 to attend the reference legislative town hall meeting on July 17, 2023. And for your follow on letter of July 13, 2023 regarding questions and concerns about the proposed EIAMD initiative to engage the public on this important Guam defense system project. Several joint region Marianas staff will attend the legislative town hall meeting to collect any written comments participants may desire to submit. Unfortunately, as discussed, I am unable to attend the meeting. The Missile Defense Agency, in cooperation with the U.S. Army, U.S. Navy, U.S. Air Force, and Federal Aviation Administration, is preparing an environmental impact statement to evaluate the potential environmental impacts and potential mitigations of deploying and operating an EIAMD system to defend Guam against rapidly developing, rapidly evolving advanced missile threats from regional adversaries. The MDA, the MDA is at the beginning of the National Environmental Policy Act process and many of the questions you pose will be finalized in the coming months and will be available in the draft EIS. The first step in the NEPA process is the scoping period, which we have been in since May 5, 2023. During this period, MDA is asking the public to help identify the scope of the EIS, potential alternatives, and identify environmental concerns that should be considered. Due to the impacts of Typhoon Mawar, public scoping meetings were postponed in June to allow the people of Guam to focus on recovery efforts. The public scoping period was extended from May 5 to June 27, 2023, to May 5 to August 11, 2023, and will be further extended to August 18, 2023. Information about the project and opportunities to provide comments are available at the project website, www.mda.mil slash system slash EIAMD dot HTML. Three public scoping meetings are being rescheduled for August 2, 3, and 4. These meetings are to inform the public and the proposed, about the proposed action and accept comments on the scope of the environmental analysis. The public scoping meetings will be in an open house format and will include stations staffed by the project representative experts who can provide information and answer questions about the proposed action and the upcoming environmental impact analysis. Additionally, our staff will be able to discuss many of the questions that you have posed. 
The JRM team will support MDA and the U.S. Army through the review of various baseline assessments, the environmental impact analysis, as well as provide guidance on various issues and resources unique to Guam. MDA and the U.S. Army have the requisite technical exper expertise to represent the technical analysis to support the deployment and operation of an EIAMD system for Guam. To be clear, the EIAMD project is not considering nuclear microreactors as a power source. The public scoping meetings will be held in the following locations, August 2, Hilton Guam Resort, August 3, Micronesia Mall, August 4, Hagat Community Center. The MDA Army and JRM are committed to meaningful public involvement and will keep the public informed throughout the development of the EIS. The proposed EIAMD is anticipated to begin construction no earlier than 2025 after all required NEPA regulatory compliance requirements and planning and design have been completed. I would also like to inform you that MDA and the U.S. Army are extending an opportunity to provide a briefing to all members of the 37th Guam Legislature on the afternoon of July 31, 2023, prior to the public scoping meetings. If this is acceptable, please feel free to contact me directly or Mr. Randy Sablon to arrange the briefing. And then it gives contact information. Sincerely, Rear Admiral G.C. Huffman, U.S. Navy Commander. All right. We now uh, hear testimony uh, from PCIS, Dr. Congressman Underwood. Half a day. Buenas noches, todos amigos. Para ver presenta para algo na poengi de en el Pacific Center for Island Security. On behalf of the Pacific Center for Island Security, we present our analysis on the uh, enhanced integrated air and missile defense system being put before the island. And I want to thank uh, Sidus Masi to Speaker Terlai, Senator Barnett, and Senator Paris for putting this uh, town hall uh, together. For large scale projects as the EIA MDS, the community needs to gather and to deliberate. And one of the most important questions to deliberate is exactly what is being asked of our community, what is being asked of Guam. From the pieces of the puzzle we can put together, there are certain things that become clear. The first is that EIA, MDS, and all that will come with it will be a critical reordering of our lives here in Guam. To put it differently, this is a paradigm-shifting project, project that will affect each and every one of us who call this island home. Due to the distributed nature of the sites, we can say that all parts of the EIA MDS are likely coming to your village. And as I've noted in a recent op-ed, as residents of this island, we are being asked, really, to shoulder the burden of being a first strike community. That's what Guam is becoming in this uh, enhanced uh, geostrategic competition. In the case of conflict between the United States and China, Guam's intended role is to be the first line of attack, not the first line of defense. In this regard, we are being asked to be a kind of sacrificial lamb. Living in the first strike community, transparency regarding the transformation of our island is imperative, yet transparency is lacking. Honest and serious deliberation of the EIA MDS requires us not only to know the bigger picture, but also some of the details. However, because the missile defense system has not disclosed what it wants to put on the 20 candidate sites, all that is being asked of our community is not clear. But we do know that it is going to burden the community with additional Guam lands being impacted. We also know that the system will be mobile and be moving around the island. We know that the threat to the community is being spread beyond the bases and into the broader community. My first reaction to the MDA's release for an enhanced integrated air and missile defense system was EGADS, and maybe that's a better name for it. 
Enhanced Guam Air Defense System, EGADS. And so this raises more questions than it provides answers. There is no information about what components of the system are being proposed for each site. As such, it is impossible to know what to comment on. The lack of information or transparency cannot be excused by the DOD simply saying, this will come after the scoping process. For the community, providing comments about the 20 sites is a pure guessing game. If a site is near or in your village, a re, is it a re, relocatable radar, a launch site, a possible C2 node, or a micronuclear reactor are likely to raise different levels of concern. How many launchers are there? What are the anticipated blast radiuses around each site that should be anticipated if the site is targeted by an adversary? It is difficult to provide an intelligent observation about the EGAD sites if your only option is limited to a blindfold and you're constantly being asked to guess which part is being pinned to one of these 20 sites. The tragedy is that the MDA and GRM already know what they want on these sites. The Federal Register notice clearly states that the sites have been selected for their quote, optimized value, unquote. The U.S. military knows, but they are not informing the community that will be affected. The military knows what is planned, but wants the community to provide input without the benefit of this basic knowledge. The very fact that so much is unclear makes one thing very clear, that Guam is being used as an experimental test site for missile defense development in general. At a public event, MDA Director Vice Admiral Hill, referring to the new technologies, said, typically, you go to demo that first, prove that it works, and then move from there. And as everything, in, as is, everything is interconnected, as you know, so what we learn in Guam is also something that can be applied here. Because you've got to remember, Guam is really about the size of Chicago, right? So I think it's very applicable to what we'll do in the United States. Guam is being shaped into a laboratory for a conflict ecosystem in the, the Indo-Pacific, and we have no real choice in the matter. We're being asked to provide input and maybe some consultation. Yet, is there another way? Yes, there is an alternative to what is being proposed. That is the system that is currently in place. Although the MDA's proposal includes future sensor technologies and the meshing of the services, various communications and command and control systems, all of the shooters are ra and radars are built on existing technologies. In addition to the Army-operated SAD for bis uh, ballistic missile intercepts, the Navy has deployed Aegis-capable vessels off of Guam to provide an additional layer of counter messages com uh, coverage. A Patriot system would be added to address more terminal phase non-ballistic targets. A key element of the EGADS proposal is to move the Aegis system ashore, off of the ships and onto the land. From the Navy's point of view, this is a fairly straightforward calculus. The Navy sees its mission as providing layered defense for maritime assets and not for possible targets on land. As the head of the Missile Defense Advocacy Alliance recently noted, relieving the Navy of this afloat duty is possibly the number one driving point of this thing, the EIA-MDS. So those ships can do other missions and do what they're supposed to do. This view is an echo of statements made by successive commanders of Indo-PACOM who seek to relieve the three Aegis ships that are currently serving this purpose. In a nutshell, the most significant element of this EGADS plan is to relocate military functions from a military platform to sites on land and amongst a civilian population in Guam. This is more dispersed than Aegis Ashore versions in Eastern Europe, it is a disaggravated version of the Aegis Ashore. 
This aggregated, dispersed infrastructure on land is something that the outgoing head of the MDA described as weaponizing Guam. Um, uh, Leland Bettis from the Pacific Center for Island Security. Um, so, you know, we talked about what we don't know, but a big question is, you know, does the missile defense system work? Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to go through this quickly. Um, all the current technology that exists for missile interception is based on a hit-to-kill method. And what this basically means is that um, it's a bullet striking a bullet, and for all the sensors that you can get to, to measure launch and measure and track missiles in flight, it's really the uh, hitting a bullet with a bullet that's the hard part of missile defense, and it's the weakest point. Now, there are various categories of missile threats and proposed responses. Currently, uh, ballistic missiles are targeted what's called mid-course when they're up in space and before they begin their descent toward a target on Earth. Um, there's work being done on hitting missiles in their what's called terminal phase as they approach their targets at high speeds, but this is a much more complex problem, um, especially given the increasing maneuverability and countermeasures of modern missiles. Non-ballistic missiles present a, a much more complex problem for uh, missile defense. Cruise and hypersonic, hypersonic missiles with varying levels of targeting maneuverability and speeds can come from any direction or any altitude, uh, from orbital launches or attempts to fly below traditional radar. The unpredictability of, direct, of this directional threat has led to increased multi-domain sensor developments, uh, in particular uh, in, in space and satellites and the various layers, and propose new ways to share information and improve target discrimination. But these in-process improvements for target tracking still depend on hit-to-kill intercepts for defeating missiles. Well, how, so how effective is missile defense in this context? In general, the MDA's plans are an assortment of deliverables from various services, services that have yet to be deployed or fully tested, enhanced and integrated to the E and the I in this proposal are just aspirational in, in most of the military's lexicon. The U.S. Army's Integrated Battle Command System, which is a part of this plan, has been beset by a decade of stops and starts and is only now being tested in the field. The inter-service communications network called the Joint All-Domain Command and Control, uh, which is to connect all land, air, sea, space, and cyber sensors and shooters is still evolving. It's not even working. So even before integrated has been proven, the MDA's Guam plan calls for enhanced integration. The enhanced systems include many of the still in process integrated command and control functions, but also propose to connect even an even broader array of users, sensors, and shooters. The enhanced measures are clearly in development, and these range from constellations of satellites, which have, by the way, yet to be deployed, um, a new generation of, of ground stations that are in the pipeline, and new radars. On top of all these enhanced sensors, an array of shooters for different types of missiles are required for the system. While most of these will build on existing missile and launch technology, countermeasures, importantly like the hypersonic glide phase interceptor, are still going to be years out and at very, very early stage of development. The Department of Defense's Independent Testing Office and the GAO have consistently found that existing U.S. missile defenses are under-tested, test-rescripted, and the results are not transparent. These offices have also found that missile defense has limited, has, even though it has a limited capability against a small number of ballistic missile threats, it really is not able to defeat complex countermeasures like multiple independent uh, reentry vehicles, which are now standard on most uh, missiles, or highly renewable hypersonic vehicles, uh, which remain unproven. Moreover, the Point Defense Patriot system is the only one in the U.S. Miss missile defense arsenal that has been used in combat, and while it has had some noted successes, its effectiveness against complex threats remains an open question. So the real big, the real big question about all this is will this supposed defense of Guam system really defend Guam? When talking about the Guam proposal specifically, the MDA proposed architecture is a combination system of systems, something which is very hard to achieve. The head of the MDA described it as hard, hard work with no known development in state. The Department of Defense's Independent Testing Office 
and the Congress have already expressed reservations about this architecture and the underlying components that, that themselves are not proven. This system of systems is not anticipated to be a shield. Even if optimized, the defense of Guam EIA MDS system, if it worked completely as planned, would have a limited effectiveness against the numerous, as the MDA describes it, simultaneous raids of drone, cruise, ballistic, maneuvering, and hypersonic threats. More pointedly, what level of defense in Guam is actually anticipated? Is this just for military bases and assets? Are the people of Guam the ones being defended? Where are the shelters for the civilian population in this defense of Guam plan? To be sure, the keenest observers will not be able to extrapolate even a theoretical level of effectiveness for this system against the possible mix of incoming missiles if there is no information about the number and mix of launcher and missile countermeasures. In assessing the effectiveness of a missile anti-missile calculus, the math matters. Just by example, a THAAD battery has eight tubes in it per launch. A Patriot battery has either four or 16, depending on the type of missile used. So knowing how many launchers and what type of launchers is really important for us to understand how much is, could be thrown up against incoming missiles. Without more information, it is impossible to measure even the theoretical impact of this quote unquote system. What is clear is that stream raids or saturation attacks would overwhelm the limited number of countermeasures, even in the highly unlikely scenario that every interceptor hit an incoming missile. The best evidence of the limits of this missile defense plan are clear from other parts of US strategy. The evolving distributed and dispersed operating concept that scatters American forces throughout the region and makes an adversary's missile targeting calculus more complex is an example. But closer to home, the development of divert airfields in and around Guam in the event that Anderson Air Force Base is quote unquote not available illustrates the understood limits of missile defense as a defensive measure. Uh, Kenneth Goldfig and Cooper, Pacific Center for Island Security. So the next question we need to ask is what does the system do for peace and stability here in Guam? Many in Guam may accept or find the system desirable because of the heating geopolitical environment we find ourselves in today. Assuredly, people are concerned about the future, are concerned about the future and view China as an existential threat. It is even common to hear that Guam must give the military anything they want or China will take over. Before diving into this, it would bode well for us as an island community to realize that we are the important fallback for the United States in this region for military activity. Former Congressman Ben Blas once said that Guam is equal in war but not in peace. This was powerful in illuminating the democratic deficiencies in our unincorporated territory status. We want to take Congressman Blas's statement one step further and dare to argue that we are also not equal in war. Guam bears a much heavier burden of U.S. national security than most states do especially when it comes to prospective conflict with China. The Chinese have made it clear that Guam is a target. A Chinese analyst recently noted that the U.S., quote, has made Guam the world's largest island military base, uh, end quote. Chinese Air Forces have reportedly practiced targeting Guam. Anderson Air Force Base has been featured in Chinese attack videos, and there are indications that Apra Harbor was a mock-up for Chinese ballistic missile practice. State-run media in China have said that U.S. forces in Guam pose a great threat to the People's Liberation Army. Many may look at this as providing the reason for supporting this system, yet we must remember a few things before falling back to this position. The first is that if China and the United States are two elephants fighting, Guam is the grass in the middle. Whichever elephant you root for, we get stomped and destroyed as the grass. This is not a value judgment, but rather an empirical explanation of our position in current geopolitics. Being critical of the EIA MDS is not an anti-US position or a pro-China position. Rather, a healthy skepticism about something so transformative for the island is an inherently pro-Guam position. Let's look at our position as the grass in the middle using the example of Taiwan. In recent war games surrounding a Chinese amphibious invasion of Taiwan, Guam was targeted in every scenario of a US-China conflict. While Guam is not the only target, the targeting of Guam is consistent. As we, as we in PCIS has, have asked elsewhere, as the prime target of weapons that are continuously being developed to specifically target military assets in Guam, all roads lead to Guam. Is this a road we want to stand on? Related to this, there is uncertainty not only what type of support 
US allies will provide in the case of a Taiwan conflict, but also if there will be any support at all. As stated in a Lowy Institute article today, a recent report by the RAND Corporation assessed that just two US allies in the Indo-Pacific, Australia and Japan, could be expected to help the United States. Moreover, this would likely just lie in the realm of limited support. As such, allied assistance may consist of a little more than a sanctions regime similar to that which the United States and its allies have imposed on Russia for its invasion of Ukraine, end quote. A conflict that begins with the use of standoff weapons, how many other allies and partners in the region join the U.S. will directly affect how Guam is targeted. This calculus is also simple. The adversary only has a certain number of long-range weapons. If allies in Japan, Korea, the Philippines, and Australia join the U.S., the stock of missiles will have to account for these targets. If U.S. allies stand down in a U.S.-China conflict, then there will be more weapons to target Guam. The second thing to remember is that while the current plans are for defensive capabilities, there are indications that this could lay the groundwork for hosting more offensive capabilities in Guam, particularly ground-based intermediate-range ballistic missiles. The third thing to remember is that Guam is important to the United States in three ways. Its strategic location, its existence as an island, and its political status as a territory. From this, we have three main uses. A logistics hub, a power projection hub, and a place to display credibilities to U.S. allies in the Indo-Pacific. Essentially, the United States aims to deter China from Guam. However, deterrence needs to be accompanied with diplomacy. It is no exaggeration to say that Guam is the American community most in need of peace between the U.S. and China. Yet increasingly, diplomacy seems to be discounted in favor of us versus them frameworks. Without diplomacy and restraint, this trajectory seems headed to conflict. This is especially important considering that almost every week there is a new story regarding how Guam is being prepared for this conflict. The fourth thing that we should remember is that the risks of miscalculation are high for the people of Guam. Miscalculation may be a temporary roadblock in the strategic minds of some, but for us, miscalculation could be terminal. Just as the effects of climate change disproportionately affect the islands, the islands will also disproportionately bear the consequences of miscalculation. Losing Guam in the event of a conflict with China would inevitably be a huge loss for the United States. For us, though, lives, societies, cultures, ancestral lands, and languages would be lost. Related to this, the final thing we should remember is that we in the community have a unique vantage point in which to view this issue. We live here. We call this island home. Experts acknowledge that the proposed missile defense will not stop everything. For example, they write that defense architecture from Guam cannot be held to a zero leak standard. This means a leaker means a warhead that has escaped layers of missile defense. Thus, scholars and policy wonks want to shift the conversation from purely defending Guam to showing that even if Guam is attacked, operations will continue from the island. The emphasis is on making Guam resilient. In a conversation that we had with a wargaming expert, if a nuclear weapon hits Anderson, people in the south of the island should probably be fine, end quote. This shows that there is a large chasm that lies between outsiders viewing a conflict involving Guam and our perspective here in Guam. The risk of escalation and conflict means something different for those of us who live here. The conversation about missile defense in Guam's future in a conflict with China must include those of us who call this island home. Just to speak uh, briefly to the nuclear micro-reactor issue, which I heard your comment from the Admiral, I just should note that um, this issue has come up, has been, on, been on, on the target list for the Army for some time. Guam has been a site that's been identified as a location it could be used. And the Senate just last month um, called up this issue with respect to a briefing. So generally, the potential relationship between this EIA-MDS framework and the capacity of the Pele project microreactors appears consistent. Microreactors of this type have been discussed by the Army and approved plans uh, specifically rate, re relate to Project Pele. This type of reactor generates a small amount of power between one and five megawatts, um, and these reactors have been of interest as a way for DOD to provide the military services with a consistent source of power um, or where there is no readily available fuel source as the DOD project manager for Pele describes it, the microreactors, quote, will be used at remote military installations to ensure tactical readiness, especially in areas where regional electrical grid 
is unsustainable or vulnerable to interruption of power. <clears throat> now clearly, five megawatts of power is a drop in the bucket for Guam's island-wide power capacity of over 400 megawatts. Thus, it seems highly unlikely that one or even five of these reactors would have a significant addition to the Guam island-wide power system. This basic capacity limit suggests the possibility that a nuclear reactor would serve as a principal source of power or a redundant power source for mission critical operations. In this regard, providing power source for the EIA MDS seems feasible, but again, uh, we don't have a lot in the way of disclosure beyond what the Admiral has communicated to you, uh, Madam Speaker. More information is gonna be needed. Um, and again, we know that the Senate has put a, a marker on this. But stepping back for a moment, all things being equal, a community conversation about the possible use of nuclear power as a cheaper, stable source of electrification is one that might be useful. But that's really not what is being talked about by either the Army or the Senate. The discussion that's bubbled beneath the surface for the last couple of years broke with the Senate's NDAA language, which specifically points to military uses of microreactors in Guam. There are two important things to consider about placing a microreactor supporting military operations in a conflict zone. One, is there gonna be a target? And this is particularly the case with respect to the Chinese who have made a point in their strategy of attacking support systems of military systems. Secondly, the likelihood of extensive radiological consequences if your reactor is struck is significant. Like the components of the uh, enhanced integrated air and missile defense system that's being proposed, Project Pele reactors are also meant to be mobile. They are not to be buried or encased in concrete. And what this does is it increases, um, it increases the damage that will be caused by a strike, and it also increases the spread of reactor fragments and the resulting contamination hazard in the event of an attack. But these basic critiques of the use of Pele in, in conflict zones are widely shared. Um, some very conservative um, accolades from the Hudson Institute, Brian Clark, and the Nonproliferation Policy Education Center's Henry Sokolsky amplified the concerns above and then underlined them by writing, Pele is the wrong answer for tomorrow's power-hungry military. The expert views of Pele and conflict zone makes it necessary for us to have a conversation about any DOD proposal to place nuclear microreactors in Guam. Whether a microreactor is a component of the EIA-MDS directly, a component that DOD may attempt to introduce separate from the EIA-MDS environmental process, or for any other purpose, microprocessors should not be a one-way conversation. Placement of microreactors in Guam should only come after community conversation that weighs the risks, the high standards for the best regulatory and safety environment from which they would operate. Uh, thank you for uh, your indulgence on this presentation, and uh, I just want to uh, conclude by uh, saying a couple of things, but I also wanted to say that the Pacific Center for Island Security is intent on trying to provide as much information on all aspects of the proposed buildup, and in fact, the whole uh, geostrategic competition uh, that exists in, the, in this part of the world, because we have no one really paying attention to us other than uh, occasional uh, uh, snippets of information from think tanks. So we're trying to uh, provide that and synthesize it and hopefully empower the kind of process that uh, Carlotta and, uh, and, and Vera have, uh, have indicated that the governor's office is engaged in. But to conclude, the most transparent problem before us as a community and a government is actually the lack of transparency. We're really chasing a phantom. We as a community should not be put in the position of asking questions about unknowns. We deserve good, straightforward information and answers. Our leaders need to be devoted to putting information in the hands of the public, and I believe that you, the legislature, need to hold the Department of Defense's feet to the fire. And the DOD needs to be transparent and direct in revealing their plans to the public. You know, in the long run, we may disagree with each other on whether we want EGADs here in Guam or not. And we may even differ on the effect that it will have in protecting or securing Guam. Yet, at the very least, one thing that we should all agree on 
is that our community does not deserve an information deficit. We can all agree that the best deliberations on the future of our island are only done when we truly know what is being planned for us. There's so many questions about this process. It's about the nuclear reactors. It's about whether it's experimental. It's trying to figure out and develop a system of systems in an ongoing way. And I get the sense that we are part of that experimental bu bubble. So, uh, from this day forward, let's operate from uh, this vantage point. We deserve transparency, and anything less is asking our community to shoulder a burden prematurely. And I know that you have a lot of signs here. We're not coordinated, by the way. So you have signs here in the back. And the one that says, uh, uh, what does it say? Which one's the tip of the spear there? There's one there. Oh, there we go. We are not the tip of the spear. We aren't the tip of the spear anymore. We're the first strike community. That's what's envisioned for this island in case of a conflict with China. So thank you very much and appreciate your indulgence. Thank you very much, Congressman Underwood, Mr. Bettis, and uh, Dr. Cooper. Um, all right, I'm going to open now for the panel for questions. Uh, I just want to note, though, that we also have in our audience uh, former Senator Bob Klitsky. Thank you, Senator, for being here. And uh, we have other agency heads who have not signed up to testify, but they are here at our invitation, and I want to acknowledge them. The Guam EPA, uh, Acting Director Michelle Lastimosa, uh, Jesse Cruz, also from EPA, Uh, the Director of Agriculture, Chelsea Munya Brett. Uh, Ms. Vanjie Luhan is here for GWA. I see Chris Budassi as well. And Roy Gamboa from Department of Agriculture. Melvin Wampan Borja from the Commission on Decolonization and the uh, Department of Tomorrow Affairs. Thank you, directors. We also have um, representatives from JRM here as well. Mr. Joe Kanata, Chief Program Officer for the Guam Preservation Trust, Ito All right, so Senators, uh, Burnett. Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'd like to thank the Pacific Center for Island Security for that very informative uh, presentation. But, I, you know, I just want to start off playing devil's advocate. Where can people find that, that information? It's public information. I mean, it's out there. So we're talking Federal Register, Congressional Record, that kind of thing? Yes, um, we're clearly chasing information right. where we can find it. Um, and it, again, it's very clear that, that Missile Defense and JRM have this information. It should be provided. Um, and let me just make a, a very clear point. Uh, the head of missile defense has repeatedly talked about the relationship that MDA has with Joint Region Marianas. So, uh, you know, Joint Region Marianas, as he said it, is responsible, basically they're a real estate agent. So they know what's going on these sites, they know how many acres are involved, they know what the setbacks are. Uh, that should be shared. That we don't know because that's not public information, it hasn't been, it's not located anywhere we found. But we do know that um, High-level officials in the Department of Defense have indicated that this information clearly is shared between Missile Defense and JRM. What do you what do you make of that information gap? Because we have uh, you know representatives from um, the government of Guam who are kind of supposed to be ahead of this thing, and you guys come in here with you know I mean pages upon pages of information that you've been able to compile. And I know that um, the former congressman had said that you want to use this uh, information to kind of color and temper how we move forward. But I would just ask, uh, what do you make of that gap where we have all this information being reported out in the media, but our own government knows uh, little to nothing about this uh, system and, and all of the things it's uh, proposing? And well, how that, detrimental do you think that is, given that we're so close to these uh, scoping meetings? Well, I, I think that the, uh, uh, there's a couple of issues at work there. 
One is that all the items that we refer to here are open source materials. You can get them uh, through research, through contact with other think tanks, which we have done so in a di uh, diligent way. The other thing is that the government of Guam agencies themselves, of course, are only part of the puzzle. They're not expected to know everything, and sometimes they're not told everything. So uh, it really behooves, uh, I think, the legislature working with the executive branch to identify those things that we should know about before we were required to make comment. And so this, this, this idea of the uh, 20 uh, candidate sites, I, don't, I, don't, I hesitate to call them candidate because they're not up for election. I wish they were, We'd, I'd vote against them, but they're proposed sites. So those 20 candidate sites, uh, the information about them is known and so you know, to ask uh, various government agencies, uh, have you been approached about this, is a, is a fair question. And I, I know that they will give honest answers, but really the agencies themselves need to be armed with a kind of a strategic vision about what we're trying to achieve here, what we're trying to protect, what information we're trying to secure. Even if, if individuals felt like, well, uh, we, we should make some kind of infrastructure deal with the Department of Defense. Even if that were the objective, it would, uh, it would be to Guam's benefit to get as much information in advance in order to carry that out. So, uh, yes, I, you know, uh, maybe the, the government of Guam agencies are doing their due diligence, but in reality, uh, I, I don't think we have much of a kind of a strategic view as to what we want out of this and what are we trying to protect ourselves from. And so when they go through the scoping meetings and they go through the NEPA process, they're just checklists. They're checklists that the bureaucracy has to go through in, in the federal government. And so what we do is we kind of respond in kind and, you know, Sometimes our hopes get uh, elevated and sometimes they have a, an impact, but I don't know that they really change people, the, the, the direction, unless we had a different kind of strategic vision. Uh, you, you, for the first time, at, at least that I've noticed on the record, uh, referred to Guam as uh, now being a first strike community. Could you elaborate uh, more on that for the people who are watching? Well, you know, it, it just it, it occurred to me that the, what, what is being contemplated here is the, and all the resiliency that's being planned is that they anticipate that the first strike will be Guam. And so that the defense planners are not, they're trying to say they're focused on defending Guam, but in reality they're equally focused and maybe more focused on what they do after Guam is hit. So, so we're kind of being offered as a first strike community. So that's why I, I focused on the, uh, the thing there about being the tip of the spear. Uh, you know, the, it implies that we're just the, the launching pad for different things and uh, uh, the, the projection of power into uh, the uh, Asia Pacific region, the Indo Pacific region now. Uh, but it's, it's more than that. Now they're anticipating us uh, being a first strike community. I just wonder when people really uh, want to contemplate what that means. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, there's various scenarios. They, they go through them all the time. All these think tanks go through them. I, I had a briefing with uh, one think tank uh, about two months ago, uh, before the typhoon, in which they said, yeah, we did 24 scenarios uh, of, of conflict o over Taiwan. Each one of them, Guam is hit first. Guam is the first strike. And they said, you know, uh, I said, well, what do you recommend if you live on Guam? They said, don't live near a base. I said, well, that just doesn't seem like a, a, a way to live, a way to accommodate our, our lives. So that's, uh, it's, it's very uh, dispiriting. Of course, planners are expected to sort of be dispassionate. Yeah, you could survive a nuclear attack. Yeah, if the nuclear attack went north, maybe a limited, you could survive it. Well, that's not, uh, it's really how do we prevent that? Thank, thank you, Congressman. And I got a, uh, I don't think our five minute uh, period accounted for your long, your <laughs> long winded <laughs> answers. But you know, I attended a briefing at Joint Region Marianas when, uh, at the beginning of this term, and, and one of my colleagues had asked the question of uh, the military uh, officials who are present, 
Uh, what happens in the event that, you know, a nuke is launched towards uh, Guam? And I think uh, what the answer that we were given was, it's a bad day for everyone. And so <laughs> that was, uh, I mean, f being labeled a first strike community is, a, is a more alarming than that. But I wanted to kind of switch gears to uh, the agency representatives and thank you for the information that you provided. But I just had one question before we move on to Senator Sabina is, you had mentioned that um, it's basically the same people who are working on our comments uh, now that submitted comments in the last draft EIS, and I know there are many people in this room and across the island who would argue that uh, we didn't get such a great deal, um, you know, with, with that. So what are we doing moving forward with this process to ensure that we do get the best deal for the people of Guam? We will take the information that we have. We will use um, all of what is available to us to drive the comments. And in the FOIA that you gave us, I would just like to add uh, almost all of the information that was just revealed by my colleagues to the left were in different articles that Vera has sent me or I've sent to somebody, et cetera. What Jonah Hill has been, I mean, uh, Admiral Hill has been saying about um, this is experimental or we want to free up Navy ships or that's going to go on land or how experimental this all is. That's something that we also read and get and know and will be incorporated into our comments. Uh, when we did these comments, we did them in 2007. What we have known, what we have learned, the new group of people that have come up, the way we can access information, the way we can go onto the internet and search, it's huge leaps ahead uh, since where we were then. So I said that this is a foundational document, the 62 pages of scoping comments that we submitted is a foundational document. But what we would have said about the marine base, we would have been concerned about water, we're gonna be concerned about power, healthcare, all of those things we're gonna be concerned about on these 19, 20 sites. You know, the, the concern that we would raise about what's gonna to happen to the jobs and the, uh, the housing and what's gonna to happen to the roads. When we throw a wide net, the government of Guam can throw a very wide net. And now added to it is this information as my colleagues to the left have said, have brought up and that we've been reading ourselves. That'll all inform us as we go forward. So I can promise you a very dynamic, diligent uh, process. Thank you, thank you ma'am. Uh, Madam Speaker, thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So, um, uh, Dr. Underwood, can you uh, again describe how is Guam going to be, or in your words, um, I guess, sacrificial um, community? Why did you come to that conclusion again? Yeah, well, I, I think that's just based on uh, uh, the kind of briefings that we've had and also the, just basically how it's, being, how it's being framed, which is that, uh, you know, uh, Guam will survive a first strike and therefore there will be a, 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 a dispersion and a, a diffusion of capabilities in order to uh, respond in time to uh, presumably China. So uh, that means that our role in this is to be uh, a kind of a sacrificial lamb, uh, but basically I think the best way to, from, for, uh, to frame it is that we're a first strike community. Uh, so uh, Leland, I was wondering, uh, is there any information, or you can point to the source of information regarding uh, these launchers and um, how mobile they are and what is the plan for them to be moved throughout the island? Um, yes, yeah, so, so mobile is the underlying principle of this entire system. And, that's, and the idea, again, is maybe you have 20 candidate sites, but you might have launchers on all 20. You may have launchers on 10. Again, we don't know the details yet because we don't know how many launchers they're anticipating bringing here. Uh, but mobile is what it's all about. Even the command and control is supposed to be mobile. Sensors will be mobile. Uh, they probably one of the radars will be permanent, but a lot of this is going to be moving around. Uh, so, in effect... Um, you know, as you try to make the enemy's targeting problem more difficult, you have to, you know, hopefully you don't get shot at a site. You know, one of your launchers doesn't get taken out. They will be targeted. Hopefully it doesn't get taken out. So if it is able to say, expend its, um, its battery of, of uh, interceptors, eight of them, let's say, what does it do next? 
It doesn't have eight more missiles lying by its side. It's literally got to go from that site and drive to somewhere to be reloaded. So as you, if you think about this, and this is again why you have a bunch of different candidate sites, the launchers will be moving around in the community as well during conflict. And, and that's part of the value on the defense side to having the system set up this way because it makes it more difficult for the enemy to actually target one of the, the shooters. It also makes it more risky for the community because these shooters are literally moving through the community during conflict. Um, and you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure this stuff out. Um, there was, a, was a, a story just this past week about the success of a drone shooting an ISIS leader who was riding his bicycle in Syria. So it's not like there's not capabilities to, to hit people on the move. But is there a source document that you can point to the public in regards to this mobility? Oh, this is all over the place. Yeah, this yeah. is uh, any, anyone that dives in to this system. Uh, this is the benchmark. And again, it's not like uh, the system that's been when they moved Aegis ashore in Eastern Europe, where you had all the shooters together with a radar uh, array. In this case, it's a really dispersed system. Or as Admiral Hill talked about it, weaponizing it. So conceivably, this is on civilian land. Um, I, think there's, uh, I think there's been an indication there's some civilian land. Um, I would also expect that there's going to be significant uh, conservation easements or some sort of easements to deal with electromagnetic radiation, to deal with blast zones. And we don't yet know again how much each of these 20 candidate sites will have setbacks for other, requ other easement requirements. So we don't have the full information then provided to us at this time? N no, we don't. And again, uh, you know, Admiral Hill said very clearly, you probably know there's a large percentage of land in Guam, he's saying, that is available to us. This capability, so we're going to stay very close to the joint regional command there for land allocations and siting. That's what Admiral Hill said. Somebody knows how much land is involved and what's going on in these sites. Okay, and, and the topic of micro-nuclear reactors, so in the letter that was provided uh, to the speaker that it was not being considered, but yet, can you confirm that it was funded by the most recent version of the National Defense Authorization Act? Is that uh, correct? No, it's not funded. This, so the, the, the micro-nuclear reactors are in development at the Idaho uh, labs. Uh, the Department of Defense has a program uh, assigned to this Department of Energy lab to manage uh, Department of Defense's interest in using them. And what was in the Senate version of the National Defense Authorization Act was support for the use of micronuclear reactors and, the, and they wanted a briefing on the possible use of these reactors in Guam. Now again, uh, the Admiral said it's not part of this particular process, but that of course, you know, there is a track that's going where the Army has already approved these to be used in Guam and the Senate is, says they support them being used and they want a briefing about Guam. Could they be added to the EIMDS? Is it technically a part of this scoping process? That's very likely. Uh, it's also very clear in the Federal Register and in the disclosure documents that power plants are going to be a part of the project. So we, I, I, we'll see how this shakes out. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, this question is for Carlotta. Uh, in regards to you know, the past, I mean, you mentioned that you're going to use the, um, the 2007, um, uh, what is it, Civilian Mil Military Task Force as a uh, foundational document. Um, but what is different about this particular buildup that we may have to modify uh, what was done in the past? Do you see any difference from the past? Everything that we're going to be concerned about, wherever these sites may be, we're going to be concerned about land, we're going to be concerned about the impact to the environment, to the people in the area. We're going to be concerned about what happens when you dig it up and uh, what kind of culture and, and historic artifacts that you will come across. Everything that we brought up in the uh, military buildup for the Marine base, there was even a section, as I mentioned earlier, where uh, the government expressed concerns about nuclear capability and demanding studies and boundaries and putting parameters on that. So you kind of just um, put it out there. Um, I could give you the copies of what, we, of what we did. And what I would add to that, Senator, is um, it's, not just the, it's not just this that's going to be the foundational document. What happened was um, 
the government of Guam continued on and there were more comments that were brought. And then Vera has talked to, to us about how we're gonna look at the, all of the different EISs and look for cumulative impacts as well as to find out what they had committed to live up to and have not lived up to. So it's more comprehensive than just this, but the, uh, the number one concerns we're gonna have is the impact to uh, our, our lives and our environment and our culture and our history. Those are very strongly uh, um, the, the foundations and the pillars that we tackled the marine base um, that we did with the military training and testing EIS and that we are, we're definitely going to apply to this. Every time we do it, we learn more. We have more people, more insight. We pull in more information. And then as Vera had said, we're going to go back over past ones and pull out what had been committed to and, and where are they at on that. So we're just going to build on, on what we have laid out as our concerns and the mitigation measures and the boundaries and the parameters that the government of Guam uh, tries to put up, the shields that we try to put up to protect that which is important to us. I just want to echo the sentiments of my colleague that, you know, you know as far as the, the most recent um, militarization, uh, there was definitely a large amount of impacts that was not mitigated um, actually should not have occurred, these, uh, these impacts should not have occurred, uh, namely the live fire and training rage. Training rage. Um, and so, you know, it's my hope that, you know, there's going to be a more stringent approach to this. Um, and, you know, maybe even looking at what are the shortcomings of many of our laws, because as you know, some of this, a lot of the, um, the position statements put out by agencies, by agencies is based on our current law. And maybe that's partly to blame. If I, if I could just add to that, um, I just checked with Edwin Regis of the Guam Coastal Zone Management. Our water quality standards have not been beefed up and looked at since 1984. So when you bring up um, what kind of laws would we need to go back and revisit, and what I would say to your uh, everybody here as well as the people that are listening, that the way the federal government in, in these processes, if the government of Guam has a higher standard, they have to go to that standard. Absent a government of Guam standard, then the federal standard applies. So the way to be extra vigilant on soil, water, noise, air, is to take a look at our, our, our quality of standards. And if our water quality standards have, have not been um, uh, looked at in 39 years, I would suggest, Senator, that's a good place to start. Appreciate that comment. Yes, Dr. Underwood. Yeah, since uh, I don't know whether the government of Guam has any uh, legislation or laws regarding uh, nuclear energy, but if uh, you did, in addition to upgrading those water standards, and if you, the legislature would consider some of that, then that might guide uh, or affect the planning of uh, 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 micro-nuclear reactors. That's how it would work. Yeah, keep them coming. My office is open. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Senator Taitigui. Thank you and good evening, Madam Speaker and my colleagues, and of course everyone who's here today. Appreciate it. It's always, it always feels good to see people coming out, you know, fighting for what they believe in and uh, bringing to attention as much as they can the issues that we have at, at hand. I appreciate the administration for being here. Carlotta, it's always good to see you. Thank you for being here and uh, providing some information. Um, I do want to ask you with regards to um, the prior military buildup. I remember uh, when we were going through the whole military buildup, you know, 14 years ago with the Camacho administration, and then, you know, um, we were going through the EIS. We were having uh, meetings in the legislature at the time discussing it. Was there ever a missile defense system in that uh, um, whole military buildup? Yes. And how many uh, it was, sites um, were included? What it, what it said it, at the very beginning um, was, here I'm looking at it, um, have convened to discuss the myriad of issues related to the relocation of the Marine Forces to Guam, the improvement of pier waterfront infrastructure for transient uh, aircraft carrier. At one time we thought there was going to be an aircraft carrier, so we were responding to that the placement of a U.S. Army Ballistic Missile Defense Task Force on Guam, 
the enhancement of infrastructure and logistics capabilities, the social, cultural, and economic implications, and the effects upon Guam's environment. So um, at that time, it, but what was happening at the time, it was kind of like a play saver. There was, until there was money put to the missile defense, until there was a budget at it, it was just something that was always kicking around, but it, it solidified over the years. And it solidified with the adventurism of China. And so China, uh, when, when they kicked up their um, adventurism, I, I, I don't know any other word to put it, uh, in the Pacific, um, that's when this started to become more real and more attention got paid to it. But yes, way back when, uh, it was uh, um, noted. It was noted, but did, they, um, did any of that go through at all? I would have to go back and look and review, and we're gonna be doing that to take a look at it. I, I'm not sure, uh, I'm sure we would have had comments that we would have thrown comments and, and responded to that. Uh, and, just uh, as we you, were responding when we thought there was gonna be an aircraft carrier. Can you also check what the locations were for those missiles that were in that military buildup, the location as well? If there was any, if there was, I'll, yeah. I'll take a look at it. I'll go back in time and see what we knew at the time. Yeah, I'd like to see the documentation too on that yeah, that you just mentioned you'll bring up. So a lot of that information that was done prior is very important, okay. I noticed that EPA is here and one of the questions I have and maybe Mr. Borja, um, you can answer this question with regards to any kind of work being done on the land on Guam. Um, I know that EPA has some kind of jurisdiction when it comes to inspecting like environmentally and it, because they're under the jurisdiction of the US EPA that allows them to go on military bases to like, like the dump for instance on the military base on Anderson uh, to go and ensure that they're following the guidelines and the permits are, you know, uh, intact. So is there anything on these military facilities that Department of Land Management has any say so, even with regards to, you know, you know, it was so frustrating is when I was doing some studying on uh, trying to do a one Guam map approach where the federal government and the, and Guam um, had the same map you know, it, it, it's still up to this day where um, the federal government believes they have X amount of, you know, square footage on this island and Guam says, no, we have this amount and nobody seems to, to know what those numbers are or who really owns what. So I'm just curious um, on your end, and of course, maybe Carlotta, you can answer for EPA. I know they're not up here right now, but the jurisdiction that they have, any kind of government of Guam jurisdiction on military property. Not that I know of, Senator, as far as land management is uh, concerned. I don't believe we have any jurisdiction on uh, military bases. What about EPA? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, um, Madam Speaker, can they come up or do, should we wait for the next panel? Um, some of the agency directors that are here that I recognize are not uh, indicating they were going to present testimony, but they, if they could please... Um, I, I just know. come up and answer Maybe the question. Maybe we'll just wait until it's oh, okay. clear That's so fine. that they can sit. Yeah, sure, no sure. Problem. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'll move on. Um, the Pacific Center for Island S Security. Uh, excellent. You know, I'm just so happy. Your presentation was spot on. It's, it's making me question one thing, and I hope, Carlotta, that the section about why are we put the, putting this on land? You know, why isn't any of these things, you know, is stationary? And we have submarines, you know, on this island, nuclear submarines, you know, and we have it in the Pacific area. Why do we want to have it stationed right on Guam? You know, is, is a question I have where it, it just, it's unfortunate, you know, it does puts a bullseye on our, on our island and my home. But I'm curious to see why they can't utilize, um, you know, ships, submarines, you know, incorporate those type of uh, logistics and as far as ammunition. Maybe the gentleman uh, next to you. Um. So, um, I mean, submarines have a specific purpose and, and they're usually not involved in, in intercepting missiles. Um, but the current, the current missile interception program that exists is the THAAD, which is at Northwest Field, or 
and actually moves around to Rota sometimes and sometimes to Camp Laws. And then the Aegis ships offshore, which do have some layered capability. Um, but I think your question is important in that if we look at the larger picture, if, if Guam is covered by the nuclear umbrella of a country that's got 5,000 nuclear weapons, shouldn't that be enough deterrence? Why, why are we talking about pea shooters to deal with incoming missiles if we're under the nuclear umbrella? Okay. And I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not an advocate for nuclear war, don't get me wrong, but in conflict studies, you know, and, and I, was, I lived in Guam during, uh, you know, the Cold War, and, you know, we, you know, it was kind of fatalistic, but, you know, if the big one went off, everybody was going down. And that, that's what kept the world safe, because that mutually assured destruction threat meant something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where did that go? Mm -hmm. well, thank you. I, I think, think we need to ask ourselves that question. Yeah. Well, um, if you look at the arsenal that the China has been, what they've been doing for the last 10 years, they exceeded what the anticipated amount of arsenal that they can, they're building. Um, and uh, it's, it's bypassed what the U.S. military <laughs> has uh, determined that um, they would exceed and bypass us as far as Arsenal is concerned. So I think it's, they're uh, fluffing their feathers at us is basically what it is. So last question, because I know I'm in a time limit here. Carlotta, has the administration been given any information whatsoever about these missiles and the, in any capacity whatsoever? Has the administration been given any information at all in any capacity about these missiles, the intention of these missiles? All we have is the uh, public information that uh, is on the governor's website that is also on, I think, a scoping comment uh, website. Okay. So we have, that's the information that we have. Okay, no secret meetings in <laughs> or anything like that, right? No. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes. Thank you, Senator Taitui. Senator Lujan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, thank you, panel, and colleagues as well. Just very simple questions. And uh, I think um, Mr. Posner, I think some of the uh, um, comments made here tonight, uh, you know, we have met with uh, the Joint Region Marianas as well as opportunity to tour Camp Blas and some of these questions I personally asked as well. And um, uh, answers were given, but uh, not to my satisfaction, of course, um, like the hardening of, uh, and, and um, again, on the civilian side, because a lot, uh, of course, I mean, of course, military has their, um, <clears throat> their mission, and their mission is exactly what, what we're seeing and, and what has been given to us. But we were concerned, I was asking questions based on the civilian side. Now, Senator, Senator Long Guerrero, you, um, well, first of all, supposedly these sites are going to be activated in 2027. That's four years from now, right? Okay. Um, your findings are going, or I guess, uh, when do you anticipate, again, putting out your findings from whatever it is, from fast military buildup and current website searches and things like that, when do you anticipate those findings to, to, to be produced? Well, um, Senator Barnett uh, sent a FOIA around and mm -hmm. a lot of information, um, like this one here, the CMTF, mm -hmm. this was in a document that Vera sent to all of our colleagues, mm -hmm. as well as information on the scoping comments and the NEPA, mm -hmm. Uh, comment period for citizens. So um, it's in your hands uh, to Senator Barnett because of the FOIA, that, that CMTF uh, um, scoping comments from mm -hmm. 2007. So um, you, guys will ha you guys will have it shortly already okay. no, uh, through the FOIA. And, and the reason why but I'm I, can, I can make sure if you want it, yeah, no, anything no, no, that you I, want. No, I'm, gonna, I, I'm yeah. asking because you know, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to a conclusion of what I want to say is this. Uh, how much collaboration do you have with the Pacific Island Center for Security? Um, I have been meeting with Dr. Kenneth Cooper 
on another matter for some okay. time now, the Pacific Island Forum, working on uh, the governor growing our presence mm -hmm. in the Pacific Island Forum, and he and I have been okay. working together. Okay. And in that process, we talk about a lot of things. Okay. And we've had meetings with uh, um, him, as well as with Leland, and Robert, I mean Congressman Underwood, um, is always able to meet or talk with us. And we've agreed to have continued meetings going forward. Mm -hmm. I ask them for whatever comments they have that they are concerned about so that I can present it over to Vera mm -hmm. and to our subcommittees, and we can take a look at that and drive those comments that they have uh, into, our, into our comment period for our subcommittees to review also. Mm -hmm. So I would say we're, we've begun yeah. the process yeah. on regional issues, and now we're going deeper into uh, um, military issues. Yeah. Well, I mean, the reason why I ask that question, because they're, what they're presenting tonight is more information than, than what's being provided on the government side. And so I know earlier, Dr. Uh, Dr. Underwood uh, had said, you know, the, the um, Legislature will be an integral part of, of, of this process and in a, a final finding, I, I, I guess. And I know some of us are working to, to be able to leverage some of the things that are, are being talked about, to leverage our stands and, you know, like hardening and things of that nature. We're doing that. But I'm just wondering if a finding will come out before the collaboration with the, with the legislature that, you know, are we, are we speaking with one voice? And again, tonight, now, whether, whether you agree with some of the Pacific Island, Pacific Center for Island Security testimony tonight, whether you agree with some of their findings or not, um, they're providing more, again, more information, uh, which, again, for us to, to, to research on our own as well, to be able to, to see whether we can, uh, uh, again, see if their findings are, are, are not necessarily true, but, I mean, but, but findings as well because what they provided for us tonight is more than what you provided for us. And so I'm, Senator, I'm, I'm just I... concerned that, you know, that, that uh, as was stated earlier, that uh, we, we need to speak with, with one voice. Senator, what I would, uh, I would say that um, so much, and they said it themselves, so much of what they threw out there is on the web, website, it's on the internet. They've done their due diligence. They've had the time and the uh, ability to, to dive deeper into it. So um, we know a lot of that information too from doing that kind of reading, but you know, that we were just responding to what are we gonna do with scoping? And so we just gave you the, the step-by-step -step of what scoping is and how we're gonna put together mm -hmm. in our committees and everything going forth. But um, if you review the FOIAs that Senator Barnett hit us, you can see these different articles that they're quoting are, we're exchanged back and forth between us, so okay. we are getting informed. Okay, so, so, so last question, based on the information that you have at this point, information you have at this point, uh, and you have more information than we do, based on what you have, based on the testimony from uh, the Island Center for Security testimony, today, if, if, if the government were to come up with a, with a whether, you, whether you agree or support the, the, miss, the 20 missile sites today, if you had to come up with that comment, uh, it, it, in, in your estimation or, or in your opinion, would you, would you agree with that? I would encourage the legislature to um, also ramp up and arm themselves and, and drive comments. Uh, I know in the MIT, Speaker Trelawhi had a significant number of comments uh, that she, she participated and she threw in there. So uh, I would say that there is definitely a role for the lawmakers and um, the, all the information that we have and that we know and that my colleagues to the left have shared mm -hmm. with us. Um, I would encourage mm -hmm. you, and, and I saw in a letter from the governor, she also encouraged mm -hmm. the legislature to come mm -hmm. up with their own comments, which yeah. is what has been done yeah in the past. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I have, and, and actually just for your information that I have just, just actually just last week I, I sent a draft resolution to, uh, to the Guam Power Authority working closely with Simon and who's working closely with, uh, with Ginger. Uh, I said re review that, let's, let's make sure that we have one cohesive voice regarding that and, and, and leverage because I got great concerns as well and, and Vera knows this, I asked this about our, our power grid. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we're, I mean, whether we come out publicly with that, 
but I, I, think, uh, I think we have to speak with one voice and be united in what we say if we want to leverage some, some, our situation. And, and uh, again, uh, my concern, well, there are many concerns, but this is one of many concerns, is, is our power grid. If we, if we want to harden that, that if the legislature is saying we should do this, and Guam Power Authority says we don't have to do this, then we're, not, we're, we're disjointed, we're not united. But it seems that we're united uh, in, in this situation. So we are, we are speaking up uh, and we are, we are collaborating with, with, uh, with, with agencies. And uh, it may not be holistically, um, but uh, there are, you know, there are, I think, a few of us that are, are doing the such. So, I'm, again, I, I want to thank you guys tonight for that. And I look forward to attending the scoping meetings as well and get some inf information. Because, again, when, you, when they say we're, we're is going to be activated in 2027. That Che is done deal. <laughs> it's going to be done, right? I mean, like, like the next election is going to be this. Yeah, it's, it's going to happen. <laughs> and so, you know, we come out with a comment. I mean, we're going to spend all this time and then nothing. I mean, what are we doing to leverage to make sure we get the best deal, best bang for, for what we're going to get? So, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Duluhan. Senator Brown. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Certainly welcome to all of you. This has been quite an informative presentation, but I don't leave here with any comfort level because, you know, I'm assuming the Chinese are going to wait for us to get our <laughs> defense system up and then they're going to decide to, you know, strike Guam. You know, it's interesting that we're entering into liberation. We look at war as a thing of the past, and yet at the same time, it may very much be a part of our future. And it's ironic because with U.S. policy, I mean, you know, we still trade with China. We're paying, as I mentioned, the Admiral earlier this year. I mean, we're essentially funding our own demise. So from U.S. policy standpoint, there's a lot of confusion there. Um, and then to what degree will we actually have a say in the process? I think that's important. We want to be aware and we want to know. But at the same time, we're also letting our enemies know what our defense system is and how we're going to be able to respond to whatever action that they're going to take. So it's a very challenging and a very different world and a very scary one. And you know, the question is, do we stay on Guam? Do we leave? Do we stay and fight? What do we do? Um, I think for most of our residents, this is gonna be really eye-opening. Just the thought, the contemplation about the possibility. And then at the other end, if we don't do anything to build up our defense, are we sitting ducks? Are we gonna assume that China is not going to take any action against Guam as a US territory? Because we don't have a defense system in place didn't stop them during World War II. What would we think makes them stop now? So those are pretty big realities that, you know, a lot of mental thinking can go into it, but you know, what is the practical reality for our people? How do our people deal with and prepare uh, for these potentials? Because um, China, is, as uh, Senator had mentioned earlier, I mean, China has pretty much tripled their military defense in the last three years. That's frightening. I mean, their ambition is almost world domination, and they're doing it, and they're buying it. They're not just looking, it's not just the military. I mean, how many U.S. companies have been sold to China? How many American workers work for Chinese companies? How many cars that we're driving that say made in America is actually made by China? So I think there's, uh, there's a lot of thought, uh, thought, certainly more contemplation, but at the other end of the day, uh, it's, it's frightening the possibility of what this can mean to our residents that simply want to live a life. Uh, educate our children and hopefully have a peaceful uh, retirement until God calls us. So I don't have any questions. I think a lot of information has been provided, uh, but I don't know ultimately what the solution is going to be. I don't know if knowing every detail of how our defense system is going to be sitting and whether we have a say or not in the process. That's even more important. Do we even have a say about their intention to do this? And if they don't do it, are we any safer? Those are big questions. Uh, I don't know that anyone here can actually answer that. I want to ask Dr. Underwood, but I don't think any one of us probably know the answer to that. But I appreciate the continued information. I think we have a lot to, uh, a lot to contemplate. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator. Senator Kenata. Buenas saludos, Hafri. Good evening. Sejus Masi, Senor and Senoras, Padon Fatimunizu, Pagu, Esinahani, Malaguzu, Bisangani, Torres, Hamzu, the Mangagi, Gini, Nas, Donglas, Sejus Masi, Paratoro, Itsetsu Mizu, and Toru, Mansai, Gi Puppet Mizu, Megamatunguna, Bula Probema, Gi Slata, the Megai Matunguna, Tisina, Mana, Preba Esina Programa, and Gentai, Taza, Tautaguis, the Taza, 
um, cuentos y, y público. So, I know that we, we come here today, we want to voice our concerns. Um, certainly, um, we're never going to have the greatest opportunity with everything. We have to find common ground. We will never have 100%. We will never have the 50-50. There will be parties not happy with whatever decisions are made. I certainly um, applaud the panel for the thorough information they've given us this evening. Um, there's a lot of information here to be absorbed. Certainly there are pros and cons with any, any of these scenarios. It's just where do, we, where do we go from here and how can we best navigate the situation we are currently in? We as a people need to make sure that our voices are heard loud and clear. And I'm very appreciative that you guys have came out here to make sure that that is heard. Um, and that's all I have for this evening. Um, but again, thank you guys for your esteemed knowledge and generational knowledge, certainly from the man in the middle there, Congressman Underwood, and Leland, my prim, Senator Carlotta, Mr. Joe Borah, my favorite, don't tell. But thank you guys for all your information. Nothing more, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator. Yeah, I had a couple questions. Um, so maybe for Vera and BSP, Bureau of Statistics and Plans, uh, are there, there's a land use compatibility planning study being done or is it completed? In that planning document, do they discuss anything that might be related to this, easements or conservation areas or other of the requirements that we've heard tonight that might be used? I know that the CDLO um, four years ago embarked on a um, compatible land use study from the office and it was federally funded. Um, and we have that report so we could share that. Um, I do believe that the DOD is also, um, uh, I believe in the middle of their, their um, Guam DOD uh, land use study as well. Um, we had met with them. We knew that Hawaii had done that, the DOD, and we requested uh, a study from them. Um, and again, because we did ours. Uh, so that has not yet been released. Um, and I can find out uh, what, what the timeline is for that document. What will that do for us if, if you receive it? Why, why are you asking for it? I think what we wanted, I, I think for us, it was um, definitely to look at, because as you know, there was um, net negative as part of the, the one Guam, um, and it would uh, give us a more um, updated um, picture of their, the current land that they own. Um, and then it would look at, um, certainly from that, what other, comp what compatibility issues uh, may still be lingering um, and how uh, they could work with um, Department of Land Management and others um, in those areas. And so that was uh, really the, the impetus for us uh, to, to get a, an updated plan uh, from the DOD. All right. And um, I'm, I'm glad, Senator Carlotta, you mentioned the, the pages and pages that were submitted by the government of Guam for prior EIS comments. Uh, the community as well, 11,000 comments were submitted in that EIS. The issue that I have is that all of those seem to be too late, right? The plans changed a little, but uh, overall, were very, very difficult to change. And um, the impacts that were outlined very well by the government of Guam. They predicted those impacts, they're documented, and actually we are now experiencing those. So I'm just trying to see some other way that we can do this where we can use all of our expertise and knowledge and experience and make sure we get in front of it, in front of it as much as possible. We know, you know, that uh, these are mobile, you know, that should inform our, our decision making or our planning or our comments, right? A lot more than if we didn't know they were mobile, we didn't know that 
in the NDAA, they're talking about these micronuclear reactors or nuclear micro-reactors for Guam and that they're for military purposes. Well, what military purposes? And that's where we're looking to the government of Guam to please share any information that you have. We want to know if they talk to you about land. They did it before. They went agency by agency and discussed their needs and pretty much tried to secure MOAs with different agencies for their the different needs that they had and we were unable to respond as the entire government. I think in CNMI, we saw it done differently where they were not allowed to do that agency by agency and they had to go through the governor. So I understand the governor may be considering that as well. I think those are good strategies. It's like you have to, but what I really want is if there are discussions with these agencies, the whole entire community should know about it. We should know that the military went to land management, for example, if they did and said, you know, we want all the documents on this land. What this land is what we're considering for the missile defense or, um, or you know, um, GPA. GPA is not here tonight. GWA is, thank you. And, and those type of documents, we think they have to do this planning in advance and that they have done this planning in advance. That's, that's been our experience, that they've got the sites already down to 20. They've put them on a map. They um, have contracted, it looks like, or put out the notices for contracting for architects and engineers and for the design. And I'm thinking those have to be site specific and they have to be component specific, right? And, and so of course, they, they know a lot more than they're sharing. They also, um, you know, we're finding provisions, the whole, uh, microreactor provision in the NDAA, if that was not known by any government agency, I think that's huge. That's a huge thing. For example, EPA, it's going to come up soon, I hope. Yeah, we want to know. Really, they were going to do this, and they've already authorized, you know, the studies on it, and, and the testing is going to happen in 2024 of one of these um, components, it looks like, or, or one, like a sample. Um, system. That's what I'm gathering from the documents I can read. All of that shows a lot more knowledge than, than what really um, the people of Guam are, are being told straight out. And so that's why I think when we came up with cumulative effects for that 2010 buildup, we, it took the entire community's input to to help all of us think of those, right? That uh, we got GMH's adverse, you know, list of adverse effects, DOEs, everybody's um, one by one. But we have to see that in order to help, I think, put together um, better ideas and on cumulative effects as well. And you're right, they did not honor the cumulative effect mitigation. So we talked about at that time, Huge impacts for across the island, like this one. We're talking about mo mobile components that will affect our roads. And then we see in other parts of the NDAA, they're talking about building a road, hall, ne a road network. They're talking about um, um, many other projects that I can't help but suspect that they are very much related that they're all related and we're just, we're, they're pretending that they're not. And um, I think we should be smarter than that and put them together and I'm asking you who are experts to help us to do that. That's why the oral testimony parts of the prior EIS were very helpful. And then the, they stopped that and they do these processes where there is nothing oral and you just submit it into a box and, and that's how our community was kept, I think, more uninformed, as opposed to hearing the information from other people who took the time to research it and could tell us straight out what this means and so we can, that can help to inform all of us in the work that we are doing individually. Um, all right, we're gonna move on. Um, but it, for me, it's that GovGuam component that you know, we, we want to know. What is the government of Guam discussing 
that might be related, and I think all the agency directors should be put on notice that all of these discussions with federal partners might be related, and we should at least consider it that way, right, at first. So, all right, we'll move, if, if you don't mind, uh, especially the two, the two of you and, and the three of you staying for a little while, I'm gonna, we have another panel, just one more panel, and then uh, we'll see if there are any, any more questions. Is that okay? If you can. So, uh, if I could ask Director uh, Michelle to please come though, uh, EPA, I know you didn't sign up to testify, but we did send you some questions and there are some questions from Senator Taitagui, so if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Um, maybe we'll begin with Director uh, Wami PA, Michelle Lassimosa. Uh, did you want to testify or just take questions? I'll just take questions. I didn't provide, um, I didn't um, prepare All right. our testimony. Senator Taitigui. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon. I'm not going to keep you very long. It's just that you heard my question earlier, you know, asking what's the role EPA, Guam EPA plays on any kind of property on federal properties. Um, I know you have the, you know, US EPA that gives you certain authorities to do some, I guess, investigative work or just some inspections. So what is the process? So local law extends to federal facilities. Um, so everything from our air program to our clean water um, standards to hazardous waste disposal, they all apply inside the fence. Um, so there are some um, federal laws that supersede ours where um, the, uh, the jurisdiction belongs to the federal government. Like it's not given to us, like we don't have primacy um, over, um, you know, that certain program. Um, but we do have access to uh, the bases. Uh, we do still have to go through a process of uh, security clearances to be able to access the base. Um, so there is a process that we, um, we go through with uh, their security uh, offices uh, to obtain what's called a DBIDS card so that we get access the base for inspections. Has DOD um, reached out to Guam EPA with um, any kind of, you know, request for information or any uh, forms or anything like that to? Not for this project, no. Not for this project by itself. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Are there any other questions for Guam EPA? Did I send you questions? Yeah. You did. Do you I have, have the them. answers? Can I provide them orally? Sure. I didn't provide a... Yes. Written. I'll say, okay, so first question was, what are the possible environmental and human health effects of the 360 degree EIAMD system and any of its components like command and control centers, radars, sensors, missile launchers, and missile interceptors? What about nuclear microreactors? So anytime we have a construction project, um, we do have a checklist of programs that will oversee um, and review documents submitted by the applicant. Um, so of course we look at protection of our groundwater. We look at whether or not 
there's you know water wastewater infrastructure whether or not the project includes um, you know some sort of air pollution source that we need to regulate we look at hazardous waste we look at solid waste we look at you know pesticide use toxic chemicals being stored um, we look at um, impact to drinking water um, so there there is a host of um, of environmental concerns that we look at at, at any project. And considering that this is gonna be a construction project, so all, of those, um, all of those concerns, environmental concerns, are, are going to be um, looked at from our agency. Um, so, you know, there, I'm, I'm sure there are some environmental concerns, but again, when the applicant submits uh, their, their operational plan and their intent for, uh, their intent to construct, um, that's when we'll decide whether or not the various programs in our agency will have oversight over those concerns. Um, as far as nuclear, I'm sorry, nuclear micro reactors, so that falls under um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So any nuclear um, component is licensed and regulated by the NRC. Uh, if it, is, it deals with construction, um, again, that would fall under our purview. If there is any discharge um, to you know, water systems, that falls under the Clean Water Act, um, and we'll have review and oversight um, over that uh, portion of their project. Uh, number two, has GIPA been in contact with federal officials about any of the candidate sites for the 360 degree uh, EI AMD system? The answer is no. Uh, can you speak of any environmental issues GIPA, under GIPA's purview that may be affected if the identified candidate sites were to be cleared for the 360 EI AMD uh, system's purpose? Um, again, you know, we can't we can't make assumptions until uh, a proposal is submitted to us. Um, again, I, I talked about what environmental concerns we'd look at if, with any construction project, but we don't make assumptions as to what they're gonna put on their, um, their application, what their construction plans are until we see it. We don't, um, we don't pre-approve projects before they've even been submitted. So until we see a plan, and a proposal and an application, um, that's when we'll actually address uh, those environmental issues associated with that project. All right, we can hold off on the rest. They're similar, and if, if the answer is we're not gonna know until we see the actual project, I guess my concern was that we have components that we know, and that does EPA know what danger these components present to the community and if they do know, can that be shared so that the community is aware that this component has a danger of this and that component has a danger of that? That's the kind of information I was, or EPA is always cautious of nuclear reactors because of this. And they always make sure there are protections because they emit radiation or whatever the danger is of those components that we know now. I don't think we need to wait for later to come up with what those risks are going to be. That's where I think we make a mistake. We wait when we know in advance what the components already are. We just are not being told exactly where. We know Maleso, can I ask you something like, if they put the missile launcher in Maleso, would EPA have any concerns? Or if I asked you if they put the micro nuclear micro reactor in Maleso, would EPA have any concerns? Or are you gonna tell me, we have no concerns until we know exactly what the project is? Of course there's gonna be concerns, um, but uh, again, uh, you know, our job is to make sure that, you know, with any, with any construction project um, or any development, we're gonna, we're gonna regulate and enforce based on the laws that uh, bound our authority. So if, if someone says, okay, I'm gonna build a nuclear reactor, we're gonna, number one, that's not in our purview, it belongs to NRC, but we're, uh, we're gonna look at whether or not the, the structural integrity of these micro reactors meet the intent and, and, and scope of the law. 
you know, we're not, you know, if it says, okay, it's 100%, you know, fail safe, leak proof, then we're gonna look at the regulations that govern whether or not the construction of that project is, is um, you know, has integrity. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna look at regulations that govern, you know, that construction project. Um, to say that there aren't any concerns, you know, is not, would be uh, inaccurate. Of course, there's gonna be concerns, but we're gonna look at whether or not these, you know, whatever project it is, abides and conforms to the law. Of course, there's always going to be concerns with every project, but, you know. All right. Yeah. I guess I'm just hoping that the agencies can take a more proactive approach for us, for our benefit in the community. Of course, I'm not asking you how you would, whether you're going to say yes or no to the project. I'm asking you, what should we as a community look for from your expertise? What should we as a community be concerned about, about the different components? Or, or the particular land that they've shown us on the maps, or the mobility of the entire system, that type of thing. But thank you. Any other questions for EPA? Senator Paris. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So a um, uh, question for administrator, or acting administrator. So does Guam EPA, are they authorized to permit nuclear power plants here in Guam? So not the power plants themselves. Um, we do have oversight over construction um, of these plants that, um, that we have authority over, uh, so, you know, such as clearing and grading, such as, um, you know, um, fixtures for uh, safe drinking water. Um, so the, maybe the, the structure itself, but the actual nuclear proponent, uh, uh, component of the, of the project will fall under NRC. So they license and regulate um, nuclear uh, reactors. So it's federal, federal. Yeah, okay, yes, but that's correct. Can Guam EPA, can we be authorized to, um, so that basically if a nuclear power plant wants, or if somebody wants to develop a nuclear power plant here, does Guam have a say in not allowing it. Does Guam EPA have a say in not allowing it? N not the nuclear part of it, the construction part of it, we have a say, but not the nuclear component of um, okay. Okay, thank that you. project. And then uh, just wanted to follow up what was, uh, was stated earlier by um, uh, Ms. Leon Guerrero, Carlotta, saying that um, she recommends that the, the Guam water quality standards be updated. Uh, it hasn't been changed since 1984. And I understand there's a lot of regulations that need, need updating. Um, is this going to be a priority for Guam EPA? Uh, absolutely. We still have regulations that we need to review. Um, we have certain regulations of the Clean Water Act that apply to uh, certain states, territories, and tribes. Uh, the last uh, update was that we, I believe went through your office, uh, Senator, was in 2015, um, where we have you know, primacy over our safe drinking water. Um, so there have been uh, certainly updates to our clean water uh, statute and regulations, not necessarily in its entirety, but um, certain portions as US EPA um, allows, approves or disapproves. And who in your office would be the primary, um, would, have this, would have to spearhead this? Uh, right now it's Captain Bearden, our chief engineer. Okay, so I'll be following up with him. Are there other regulations that need updating um, at this point? Um. Um, Jesse Cruz, Guam EPA. And yeah, there's um, a, a lot of our regulations, um, mainly with the clearing and grading that need to be updated. Um, we have to re-evaluate uh, um, our drinking water regulations and the um, groundwater protection zone maps and t types of those things. They're a little bit um, outdated and antiquated and doesn't really take into effect the new regulations and the housing densities or the new technologies that are available for um, drinking water and w wastewater protection. And so there's a lot that needs to be updated, ma'am. Okay, so I'll definitely look to your office uh, to mm -hmm. work on that and, and maybe hopefully expedite those. Um, I think those are my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Paris. Senator Brown, any questions for EPA?
Okay, thank you. All right. Oh, sorry, yeah. Senator Bar Barnett. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I just wanted to ask, this is the head of the uh, Guam Environmental Protection Agency. What are your thoughts on the use of, uh, potential use of uh, nuclear microreactors on island? And, and do you believe that there are any risks associated with the use of these, uh, this technology? So on your first question, um, I'm going to respectfully refrain from answering that question only because as a head of the agency, I don't want to, I don't want to seem biased to any particular geopolitical um, decisions that are made above my pay grade. Um, of course, I have concerns, you know, as a private citizen, I have my own um, worries and fears and concerns. Um, but as a government agency, I'm going to, I'm going to try to remain fair and impartial towards every applicant that comes through uh, our doors. So um, I'm going to respectfully. But I, I respect that answer, but I would just counter, but you know, you're the head of the agency that's supposed to protect our environment. And so um, I'm just asking if you uh, have any thought or you are aware of any risk, not to, to come down for or against the technology, but I'm assuming you're aware that there are risks uh, involved with the use of nuclear microreactors or nuclear reactors, and uh, if so, can you share those with us? I would say that as a layperson and not a subject matter expert, I'm going to say that, um, you know, just like everyone else here probably who thinks of nuclear anything, um, you know, the concern of radiation contamination, um, you know, it's always going to be on everybody's mind, I think, but as a subject matter expert, as not a subject matter expert, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you, you know, with confidence that, you know, these are the... I know. I know. don't think there's a single subject matter expert in this building uh, about nuclear microreactors. So maybe I'll just rephrase this because I just want to know your, give me your personal thoughts. If you can't give me your thoughts as the head of the agency that protects our environment, what are your, your personal concerns about the use of this technology? if you don't mind. I think that um, the integrity of the system is going to be uh, of the utmost concern to us. Uh, but again, that's not something that we enforce, right? So whatever, um, whatever issues we may have, it's ultimately going to be decided by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that licenses and determines whether or not these systems are, are, um, are intact whether or not they're safe, whether or not they can be licensed and permitted by this federal agency. Um, so, you know, I think it would be fair to say that we probably will not have, um, you know, the ultimate decision as Guam EPA, uh, whether or not these nuclear reactors will actually be activated. They're gonna determine whether or not it's safe and, you know, for, we're going to have to accept because they're the ones that are going to do the review of these of this project. Um, but certainly, the commitment of Guam EPA is to keep our environment safe. I, th I think that inherently we all want that. I want that. Um, so whatever our function is at Guam EPA and whatever we can oversee and control um, to make sure that 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 safety um, those safety concerns are addressed. I think that. That's, that's going to be our, our, our job to make sure that happens. Thank you for that, ma'am. I appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Um, we'll now hear from Guam Preservation Trust. Buona <clears throat> Speaker. This is Joe Kinata. Uh, from Guam Preservation Trust, uh, Senators, uh, I prepared a letter, uh, a presentation for, for this town hall meeting, and we'd like to thank you for inviting the Guam Preservation Trust to this town hall, on, town hall meeting on the Missile Defense Agency Department of Defense's proposed 360-degree enhanced integrated air and missile defense system of which we'll call it the defense system. On Guam, uh, GPT understands that this town hall's purpose is to give the public the opportunity to share information and learn the logistics and effects of DOD's proposed action before the public comment period 
for its uh, scoping process, which ends on August 11th. Um, as a public nonprofit organization that works to preserve and protect Guam's heritage and its many heritage sites and stories, we look forward to learning about the logistics and effects of this proposed project. For almost 15 years, GPT has engaged with many federal projects, especially the current military buildup and projects at the now Camp Blas. We're no stranger to the table with our local and federal neighbors, and we appreciate the partnerships and opportunities to work together and address issues surrounding protecting cultural resources in Guam. Our advice to our community as it is preparing its comments due next month is to look for common ground and not be afraid to ask questions and propose solutions. Meditate on the inifresi uofresen maisazo pabaye protehi and defendi ikutura ilenguahi i airi i hanam zanitasen tomorrow's tano tomorrow see if this pledge aligns with the mission of the proposed defense system and see if there's a common ground as in the past we wish to ensure that a clear message from our leaders be put forward, and we at GPT will do our part to support and advocate for that message and for proper compliance and stewardship of the rules and regulations relative to the National Historic Preservation Act by the affected federal agencies. We also will work with the signatures signatories such as the Guam State Historic Preservation Office on any proposed memorandum of agreement or programmatic agreement as a concurring and consulting party should we be invited to participate. As a particular comment to the project, we also ask that the Missile Defense Agency align the proposed project to also follow DOD's approach with the current military build-up projects that call for one Guam Green Guam net negative initiatives and strategies. Should historic sites be impacted, most especially with access, that com commitments or unim unimpeded access are outlined in forthcoming scoping meetings and agreement documents. These priorities should be highlighted for the federal review processes which will ensure unfettered access to important historical and cultural locations. We also must stress to the, M to the MDA that, any, that environmental resources must be analyzed in any environmental impact statement and evaluate the potential impacts of the proposed action on all resource areas to include its cumulative impacts. We look forward to receiving from the MDA surveys and studies that support the environmental impact analysis, such as cultural resource assessments, natural resource baseline surveys, and stormwater studies. We stress that the MDS remain in compliance and show good faith efforts for public transparency for areas surrounding the National Historic Preservation Act and other regulations as necessary. Furthermore, GPT seeks information on how the proposed project will affect the community's concern, most especially with how it will affect land use, resor visual resources like cultural landscapes, recreation, noise and vibration, geological resources, terrestrial biological resources, and cultural resources. In closing, GPT stresses these concerns and reiterates our commitment to assist the public as an advocate for historic preservation. We encourage MDA and DOD to maintain their commitment 
for the One Guam, Green Guam Net Negative initiative and to work with DOD's foot, to work within DOD's footprint, um, footprint, uh, commit ourselves as partners in any programmatic agreement items with SHPO and advocate that any action on the proposed project be conducted with fair and just cultural resource access programs. We look forward to working with the community and she will be of any assistance will be here. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much and I appreciate your speaking from experience for very concrete suggestions for all of us who are making comments. I very much appreciate that, the details. Um, we have others to testify. Um, Senators, would you like to have, do you have questions for Mr. Kanata? All right, if not, we'll invite um, those others signed up to testify. Please come forward. Thank you for waiting. If my staff could just check outside, make sure, last call for anyone to testify, please. Thank you. All right, Ms. Flores, you may begin. Maneka. Monaga of Pukwangi, good evening, Senators. My name is Moneka Flores, and I'm a core member of Save Ritidian, a protect, protect the Texan Save Ritidian. Um, I'm here tonight, uh, bring, you know, we all have a lot of concerns regarding this missile defense system. And as it was mentioned earlier, there are a lot of the same concerns we have about the firing range, the construction of the marine base, and um, the open burn, open detonation issue, the construction of the urban warfare training range, all of these same concerns. Um, and it's really important that we measure these concerns against the long history of environmental racism and environmental degradation um, and desecration. Uh, to our land, waters, and our heritage. Um, so as we know, more land may be con condemned by eminent domain, which means more land loss for military occupation outside of their existing footprint. Um, several impacts on vital resources, including the further destruction of native limestone forests and the loss of protected species. Risks for water contamination, risks for desecration of ancestral burials, um, as we heard tonight, the system may deploy mobile nuclear microreactors posing threats for accidents and contamination to our aquifer. Um, you know, the military has been very bold to the media, which is, is quite, you know, surprising to hear that um, folks are saying that they, 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 you know, we don't have a lot of information as Dr. Underwood has described, we're in an information abyss. However, if we go and, you know, and see some of the news articles, the military has been so bold to say that they know the 20 sites. They know that there are environmental considerations and that there are abundant challenges. And that even includes landing the equipment on Guam. Even just to land the equipment on Guam, it poses a lot of risk. Okay, and it requires extensive clearing and flattening of our land. This is gonna mean that it's going to expose unexploded ordinance. It's gonna require the treatment of that ordinance. It's going to expose ancestral burials. It's going to take more land away from Chamorro people. Um, it's gonna make us more vulnerable when we're already so vulnerable um, here on our island. After the typhoon, uh, we saw how, how vulnerable our water system was and how it's made more vulnerable because of all the clearing in the north. And um, we, we have to look at all of these existing problems and measure this as a, as a new challenge, a new risk. Um, not to mention, you know, that uh, the, these reactors will be all around the island, these launchers will be all around the island, not just on the base, but in the community, and how that's also going to impact our relations with other people or even visitors coming to Guam. I want to read a quote from the Defense News, and I'll, I'll uh, provide this link to this article to the body. Um, other, challenge, other challenges, other challenging considerations include considering the electromagnetic interference that is possible on the island as well as the effect land radars might have 
on, on that interference. For example, air operations including medevac helicopters coming to and from the area. The agency has also committed to beautification. This is what they're calling a beautification project. We're going to make launchers look beautiful and we're going to put big bubbles to cover over the radars to keep them from looking so lethal because Guam is a tourist area. This is how they're handling what, things that are going to affect our everyday lives, things that are going to affect our water security, things that are going to affect the survival of our, of our, our endangered species, things that are going to impact our economy. And you know, um, I just, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting that the Rear Admiral decided not to show up today when just recently the previous re Rear Admiral was so bold as to come down here and provide uh, t draft legislation for this body. So it's, it's extremely, it's a huge disservice that, that, rear, that the new Rear Admiral is not here tonight. And I, I wanna leave making a, a final request that beyond looking into the missile defense system and all of the other issues that we're already facing here in Guam, we need all of our leaders, the executive branch, this body, and every, every person who considers himself a protector of this island to demand for peace and diplomacy, first and foremost. The message from this administration, from all leaders, should be that peace and diplomacy should be a, a, a priority. Those conversations are not happening. The only conversations that are happening are how do we ready ourselves for war? How do we ready ourselves for possible annihilation? And we know because just you know, a few generations ago, many of our people suffered horrible atrocities and, and some of, of, of whom have survived the, the war. You know, we still live with those traumas today. War is a horrible violence you will never unsee, and it has permanently not just changed the landscape of Gua, Guahan and the Marianas, but all of Micronesia. It, it manifests in our bodies, it manifests in the violence in our communities. We are the top in the nation for suicide, for sexual violence. We have serious issues of, of uh, addiction, and in the highest in incarceration, um, population and houseless in the population are indigenous people. These are all products of our, the colonial violence that we continue to experience and the hyper-militarization of our island. It is relentless. While, we, while we are still recovering from a typhoon, while we're still grieving, they have not, they've only paused for, for but a second. And now they're continuing to push this process forward when we are still so vulnerable. Um, it's, it's, it's with a great deal of, of grief and rage that, you know, we continue to come here um, and we appreciate you providing this venue for the public. This is the first opportunity we have for our folks to ask questions and post comments and put them on the record officially. And we really thank you for giving us the opportunity because otherwise we, we might not have very many opportunities after today. And also, if I could just make one final plea to please look at any possible legislation to limit nuclear power generation for the island, to pr prohibit and restrict that for the future of Guam. Sign a and thank you so much. Appreciate your testimony. Noah? Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Uh, my name is Noah Lee Kanata Austin, father of four. I am extremely concerned regarding the plans for a missile defense system of Guam, along with my concerns of the impacts it has on our island. I have grave concerns over the supposed necessity of such a system. Despite the fear mongering of the U.S. government and media of all sorts, there is absolutely no need, as far as the well being of the people is concerned, for the U.S. to be engaged in any military conflict in the present day. <clears throat> but war means fat contracts for the military-industrial complex and access to the bounty of natural resources in foreign lands for U.S. corporations to plunder so the U.S. presses on. And I'd like to know that the same U.S. government and media institutions telling us we need to face China now are the same that lied us into Iraq in 2003, the same that lied to us during Afghanistan, saying they just needed more time and more troops to make it work, and that fell apart real quick. And as I understand that, uh, and now of course, no disrespect to any individual senators here, right? 
but I understand that our government institutions here exist by the grace of U.S. Congress and the purpose is to maintain this military outpost, which in terms of the U.S., that's all we are to them. And you know, people out here, sorry, I'm emotional, I'm nervous, but people out here, man, it's hard, dude. You think everyone here is, this is everyone that cares, it's not. This is just everyone that had the time, the energy, who's pissed off enough to come here and show their face. Most people I talk to about this, and I be talking to everyone around me. They share my same concerns, but they feel powerless. What can I do? I can't do nothing, it's just gonna go on. And when there's a people such as ourselves that are so politically powerless, we need our elected officials to step up. We need you to fight for us. Please, I am begging, I am pleading. My children's lives, all of our children's lives is at stake. We're talking about war with China where we get destroyed for imperial purposes. Even in the mainland, the citizens, they don't benefit from none of this, none of these wars. And everyone, we just feel like we have no voice. We need you guys to step it up, to push the issue, to call it out. And not no little, we just need a whole lot more than what we've been getting from our entire government. This is, I'm really upset if you cannot tell. Uh, we, cannot, we cannot even afford to live here, but the U.S. got millions, hundreds of millions for the industrial co military industrial complex to put up a missile defense system that we're not even sure is really going to work. How do we know it's even going to protect us? Are we even the primary, you know, is the mission to protect us or the military assets even? So just please, please, please work for the people fight for the people, lay it on the line for the people. Because we ain't got, there ain't nothing we can do really, man. But organize ourselves together. Talk to those around you about these things because nobody knows what we need more than us. The people in charge, their problems are not the working people's problems. And when things go down, most of us, we can't just fly out somewhere else when it's looking hot. We're stuck here. That's all I got to say. Thank you for your time. To do some mossy, Mr. Austin, Callan, Paris. Half a day speaker Terlahi, Senator Paris, Senator Barnett. Thank you, um, first of all, for having this town hall about this really important issue. Um, my name is Callan Paris. I'm a mother of three, a graduate of the University of Guam. I used to be a volunteer with Protehi Latectan with Maneka Flores to my left. And, um, with this project for the defense missile system, all of the surrounding events for it, the EIS, the scoping meetings, even this town hall reminds me of the volunteer work I did with Pratahi Latectan over several years, commenting several times on the EIS, participating in so many of these roundtable discussions, one I remember in particular where we sat here until 11 o'clock at night, um, the Admiral that day did show up and people were here crying, they were shouting, I mean, totally in opposition to the project. And the Admiral at that time very smugly kind of said like, we hear you and we understand, but we're moving forward with this project. And that's one reason why I have been less active with Pratehi Latexan in recent years, because I feel like Noah said that we're powerless, even if we protest against something, even if there's, I heard speakers say earlier, 11,000 comments about a project, it seems like they just forge ahead anyways. And they do things like put a 10 foot buffer zone around an endangered tree and call it mitigation. Or they give us a fancy building next to UOG to put the bones of our ancestors in and call it mitigation. And to me, that's not enough. Um, I'm, this kind of project is very scary for me because my children are so young and I worry that I'm not gonna be around one day to protect them from the type of war that would impact them. And Let's face it, the, the United States military has an extremely horrible history of nuclear things in the Pacific. Who's to say that these things won't melt down and cause, like that thing in Japan where 
I don't really know what it is, but anyways, Fukushima, yeah. Um, so yeah, they, they can promote mitigation all they want of these projects. There's still like millions, Maneka knows the exact number of how many bullets are getting fired above Latexan every single day, every single year. Their projects just steam ahead. So I just want to end by saying like, I'm so grateful for the three of you. Clearly you really care about this because you have this town hall. You're the only one still here. And I really feel like you guys have a chance at making a real change where maybe those of us who do volunteer work and stuff, the military doesn't seem to care what we think. Um, so I'm really glad that you're looking to get input from the public and I hope we can get as much information as possible about this and hopefully keep ourselves as safe as we can. And I'm opposed to the project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Paris. Thank you for your testimony. And I, I agree, it's, uh, it's very easy to feel powerless, but I don't think that um, we are powerless. And, uh, you know, I've, I'm not a, an optimist, I'm very cynical, skeptical, uh, but I am encouraged and a little hopeful that uh, based on the testimony that we heard here tonight from the uh, government agency heads that were in attendance, it kind of looks like we're all in the same spot. And I'm going to say I'm not really comfortable with the spot we're in because the wheels of, of this have been turning. I mean, it's an easy Google. Uh, if you just Google missile defense system Guam, you're going to come up with multiple pages. And, and by reading these articles, which I did, you know, uh, to prepare for the hearing, you'll see that um, this has been a very uh, long conversation that has been ongoing about uh, the missile uh, defense of Guam and what it's going to entail. And we have uh, been absent from that conversation. And so I am hopeful that uh, we're all on the same uh, page here. I hope that, I really hope that continues because uh, we are stepping up here in the 37th Guam legislature, but we can't hold the uh, Department of Defense's feet to the fire if other uh, elected representatives are busy roasting marshmallows over that fire that we're trying to hold their feet to. And so that's where we all have to, to really unite as a one Guam uh, voice because that's how we have continuously lost these uh, engagements and these battles uh, with the federal government. I mean, granted, of course, our political status uh, really limits us, but I will tell you what, if if the governor of this island, lieutenant governor of this island, speaker of this legislature, senators, mayors, all stood in unison and spoke with that one Guam voice, we would definitely be heard. Um, would we get what we want? That remains to be seen, but I think the, the thing that I would like to see out of this conversation is for us to, to all be saying the same thing and, and, and not for the legislature to be saying we want accountability and any other part of the government to, to be saying, no, go ahead and, and do what you want. Because like I said in my opening, we saw this uh, in the recent past with the, uh, the Eagles Field uh, Lalu uh, instance where we were brought to the table, you know, two years too late after negotiations that had already been long underway. And so um, I appreciate the testimony that we heard here tonight from the uh, government agency heads in attendance. And I, and I, although I did express encouragement and hopefulness that we're kind of on the same page, I mean, you think the opening of schools is coming quickly? At least scoping uh, hearings are coming even quicker. And I think we can all agree here that uh, I think we know what basic questions to ask, but the devil's in the details, and we don't have... Uh, any of those details. And so I think that just moving forward, we all have to get on the same page and, and don't, as easy as it is, as it is to feel powerless, uh, when we stand together, we become powerful. And so uh, don't stop standing. And I encourage you guys to, to keep standing along uh, with us. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator Barnett. Senator Paris. I um, just want to thank you all for coming here tonight. Um, I just want to say I want to reiterate words from my late dad. And he said, do what's right. Do what's right. And I think it's important what we're doing here is right. And I know we may feel 
dis d discouraged uh, because it seems like we're powerless, but I believe we're not powerless. And that's what colonization is about. It's about um, making us think that we are powerless. Um, and I think that it's important we fight these efforts to silence us. And there are many more voices out there that need to be amplified. Because as you know, this buildup has been happening across this Pacific for many years. You know, there's, there's buildup in, in Kyoto. They're putting installations up in Kyoto. We don't hear about that. Um, they're building up in the Philippines. And that's recent, or maybe it has been happening. But now we're hearing a little bit of it. But Guam, unfortunately, gets the lion's share of the, the publicity. And so what does that mean? Is Guam becoming a decoy? A decoy, um, especially for us, who have seemingly no voice, right? Because we have a power imbalance, um, you know, as far as a, a territory, a colony of the US. And, you know, it's important that the US does what's right by our people. Um, you know, they, as administering power, have the, the duty to protect the cultural and natural resources of this land until we achieve our rights to self-determination. Um, and I think every about, everything about this is wrong. Wrong for the people of Guam, wrong for the people of the Pacific, wrong for the, the international community. No one's gonna survive a nuclear war. This is what this is about. It's about gearing up for war. And what we know, history has taught us that when there's buildup, it most likely leads to war. And we're talking about much more, um, you know, war, um, weapons of mass destruction, really, is what it is. And so what you're saying today is so important for our people to hear because you know, the more that we can um, advocate for peace, peace is what we need to be advocating for. What is it gonna take to get that? And whose idea was this? Was it our people that came up with this idea? I'd be quite honestly shocked if it was. But, you know, really what we need, what we need now is peace in our lives. We have just come through a catastrophe. You know, Malwar, we're still recovering from it physically, emotionally, and now we have to deal with this. I mean, it, this is um, definitely an a, a injustice to our people. And you know, as you know, we've had to suffer cumulative injustices, and this is not right. And so in honor of my father, I think it's important that we speak out. Sujus Masi. Sujus Masi, Senator Paris. I wanna thank all of you who stuck it out tonight. Um, for all the testimony, I think uh, um, we're still here, we're not giving up, uh, and I just want to, maybe I'm just going to share with you why I don't give up. I don't give up because I really believe that when the people of Guam are united and the leaders are united, we can make a huge difference, and we have seen this, but it's rare. That's really our issue. It's, an, it's a thing that I'm hoping and hoping that we are going to overcome. I think the stakes are high and thank you for outlining those things for us. We have special motivations. This is our only home. We, we have children. All of those things that you've come here for and you've, you've you know, endured many numerous scoping meetings and comments and it's discouraging and uh, so many of our community who were so active in the build-up process getting our entire community organized informed educated and able enough informed enough to submit comments burnt out right or just felt like they can't do that work anymore. It's too negative. It's, uh, you know, we have to take care of our, our health. So it takes a toll, that's for sure. But look, today is a new day. Today, we have uh, Congressman Underwood, a former congressman, 
telling us straight out what, what we could know if we looked harder, right? And what we all now know because he took the time and the effort to organize himself with PCIS and, and come here and with all their work and form all of us. You've done the same. You've done the same for many years, many of you, Senator Carlotta. But I'm, I'm telling you, for my sake, I, I will not give up because there are always people like that who are still willing to work. And if, as long as there's one more person willing to work, and maybe even if there weren't, I'm still going to do that because it's worth it. It's always worth it. And if we acquiesce and we let it go, we can't go back on that. And, we, and it gets harder and harder and harder. So I want to thank you for taking the time because it just takes one of you to motivate one more person. And, and that's what we really need. But I'm gonna tell you how I see things for today. Just because I think, uh, I think the reality that um, Mr. Bettis, Dr. Cooper, Congressman Underwood, you, Moneca, and those, you know, other agencies who are testified have shown us the facts that we do know, those alone are alarming. Those alone show us many, many, many things that DOD is not necessarily putting together for us, right? Uh, they won't tell us what are the properties that they're actually going to cite these things on or the ones that they're actually looking at. And we know that they have alternative sites. I don't see the harm in letting us know what those are going to be. What are the non-federal properties that are involved, especially that? They've announced they're going to have to look at non-federal properties in Malesu. Why won't they tell us where that is? What will be at each of these sites? Which of the components? How many of them? At least give us an idea. We would like to know um, the different sources point to nuclear microreactors, and yet uh, in one of the letters it says, oh, be informed that that's not going to be. Well, this is the kind of information that I'm afraid our experience tells us is, is not reliable. And if everything that you Google shows NDAA has uh, in its provisions nuclear microreactors for Guam or being funded or being studied, being mandated, and that we know we can research what those are. They're mobile, they're, they're experimental, I think. Well, they're not, well, they're just re recently even allowed. But uh, so all of this, it's all coming about. I agree, the evidence looks to us today like we are being used in an experimental capacity and that our community is very much a first strike zone. I think their divert strategies of making divert airports in the different islands and divert uh, other facilities shows very much what Dr. Underwood was talking about. Their strategy of our first strike is Guam and then they can strike back from other areas. But, but we of Guam may be really taking a, an un equal, unfair burden again. We don't know their personnel needs, but they say they're going to develop housing areas, medical facilities, everything for the personnel just that are needed for these missile defense systems alone. They said they're going to build fuel stations, power stations, and so we know that those are another huge infrastructure burden. They need roads. And um, I guess what concerns me the most is that if the agencies aren't going to be proactive and they're not going to help us to inform us of what they and their expertise could know, may know, then we're, we're not going to be able to respond appropriately. 
some of the comments when the agencies put it in in the last 10 years ago was that it was, um, they're not available. I mean, I, I remember that was a big effort uh, on one, one of our friends to collect those herself, put them up on a website for the rest of us to see. And they, you know, not, not necessarily in advance. So I'm, I just think that the Department of Defense, it's, it's pretty clear. They have a lot more information than they are sharing. I think they should share that. And that uh, when they talk that um, we're, don't worry, we're going to mitigate. I totally agree with you, Callan, that the mitigation that we know from experience is not adequate at all. They mitigated thousands of acres of forests with a, trying to plant those plants in a place that was not a thriving forest, that was likely not to thrive. They, they promised to put in another, um, I, I don't remember the word is museum or a um, cultural center, and when we press them on it. What happened to that? That was written in the programmatic agreement as mitigation. They said, oh, we couldn't do it. Uh, and you're right. So we get this a repository as mitigation for cumulative impacts of loss of forests, loss of land. And now we're hearing, and this is an, another big concern of mine, that this is the, well, we've heard that this, that they've ended their net negative agreement with Guam, that they've completed their net negative agreement with Guam, and that's not part of what, and I guess that's what we're looking at now on these maps. And um, it, it's, um, so I just think there's enough information. Thank you again for sharing the information. I, I want, us as a government to work together. I don't, I think uh, it's on us, this burden to inform everyone, to share the information we have, to help everyone to make comments and to, and to make impacts. And we can make impact if we are ahead. We can't, it's very hard to do very late. And from what we know, from what we've seen in the NDAA just being released in the last few days, it, it's so much more than what the open discussions have included. And the agencies say they don't know about that, and that's so very concerning to me, that, they, that all of these discussions about extensive clearing, power, effects on water, the need for housing, all of that, never ever discuss, but very much looks like moving forward. And, and thank you again for all your research. Uh, I don't know if uh, uh, Dr. Underwood, or you have anything else to say in closing, or Carlotta, yeah, um, Senator Carlotta. But uh, we want to work together, and I think we can, and I think our community is smart enough. It's really just a matter of are we willing to to do this together. I don't want to see another situation where our community went all out, putting in comments, education, educating each other, but the deals were actually made by individuals. And they were not what the community was advocating for. I think the same happened in the MIT, in the MIT agreement, despite the community's working hard to support our leaders to say, you know, to tell, to pause these things, to, to prevent the harm. And, and, and I think it's a good situation for leaders to be in when we have a community that's active and willing to back us up. But yeah, we need our leaders to be true to that and to make sure that that's what happens in the end. That we're, building up um, your ability to negotiate for us as best as possible or to stop things. And I just sometimes the leaders don't take advantage of that. But thank you. Uh, Dr. Underwood? Yeah. Uh, 
Well, uh, thank you for uh, uh, your indulgence in our earlier presentation and the continuation of this. Uh, you know, it's a, not a, not a, I'm assuming that we are all uh, more interested in this than we were before. And that's really the, the key to this, is to make sure that the interest is generated. And then the second part, of course, is to uh, find uh, uh, or try to articulate a strategic vision about what we want. I mean, if you don't want these, uh, these 20 candidate sites, then uh, that's, that should be the objective. Because the dynamics of this ebb and flow here is that uh, we'll articulate something and then, you know, I know Senator Brown earlier said that, you know, it's like we're divulging uh, our uh, anti-missile uh, ideas to the Chinese. Well, I'm a little bit more concerned that we're divulging what we're interested in and, <laughs> and the Department of Defense is kind of coming up with, uh, with plans to counter uh, what we're pointing out here, which is... Uh, which is really the, the irony in this, of course, is that they'll come up, as uh, Senator Paris said, you know, mitigation this, mitigation for that, mitigation for this, but the, the substance uh, of the effort continues to move forward. And I think uh, this, uh, the, uh, I can't stress enough, at least for myself, you know, obviously I'm, I'm chair of PCIS, but for myself, this, this, the, this plan has the capacity to reorganize uh, the way we live in ways that we haven't really considered. And that has to do with all these things uh, put together. And uh, so, uh, and then of course the, the larger situation is to just to kind of contemplate because it is overwhelming. I think as Senator Brown has indicated, it's overwhelming uh, to think what is going to happen next. Well, if you're going to spend eight to ten billion dollars on a on a missile defense uh, architecture and structure, and they they only spent one or two billion dollars on uh, investment, they might change the nature of the region. But instead, uh, the focus is all on these countermeasures and all of this anticipation of conflict. And so, when uh, people say give a diplomacy, a chance, well, we are in a competitive, the United States is in a competitive situation with China. There are cybersecurity issues. There is economic penetration issues. But the response is not to act as if we could go back to a time 20 or 30 years ago when the United States basically walled off this part of the world. Because that's not going to happen. It's a changed world. So you have to kind of engage it and intelligently engage it and counter uh, that level of competition. So that's, that, that, that's at a larger level. But for us here, you know, I really appreciate uh, what uh, 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 Senator Leon Guerrero said and what uh, Mr. Posner said about gathering that information. But I was always cautioned that gathering all that information and being a conduit uh, and being a facilitator for commentary is not exactly the same thing as saying, this is what we want, this is where we're going, uh, what do you think about it? And that's a, that's a different order of business. So, yes, we could get, uh, you know, 30,000 comments, but if there's 30,000 uh, going in 30,000 directions, then it doesn't really uh, move the needle. So, uh, this, is, uh, this is, as they say, a kind of a, a watershed moment. I, I, I can't stress that enough. This is a watershed moment in civilian military relationships in Guam that has not been seen before. Because we know it's coming and we know that it's going to be huge and disruptive. And now that opportunity sort of existed upon the anticipation of the uh, Marine, uh, the Marines coming to Guam and Camp Blas, but the response was uh, instead of thinking, well, how is this going to reorder our lives? The idea was that how are we going to take advantage of it? And so that kind of shifting and back and forth and uh, so on. 
In the 90s, there was a different situation. The military was downsizing, trying to close things, so they were eager to do one Guam, green Guam. They were eager to uh, talk about, uh, you know, more collaboration, giving back land. All of those days are now gone. So this is a watershed movement because it's, it's going to create uh, some tension and uh, it's, it's a tough time to be a leader. So uh, I congratulate all of you for uh, working on this and uh, facilitating and listening to other people as well as, of course, people and the, the governor and the lieutenant governor and other senators are all interested vitally in this topic. But uh, this is a, a watershed moment for, for the whole island. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also uh, invited the delegate who wasn't on Guam, but I did send him questions, hoping he could also get us information and facilitate whatever information Congress is um, discussing that that would be made known on Guam immediately and that we wouldn't have to spend so much time looking for these things and proving them and debating them because he would be informing us right away. And I, I think there's also a little bit more on that. I'm not, you know, I don't, I, since I'm not in that office anymore, I don't like to uh, kind of uh, make a criticism of that or what seems to be a criticism. But uh, I know Senator Barnett saying, go ahead. <laughs> but the, the, the point is that uh, he has, uh, the, the delegate's office has the capacity to find information. Uh, it's not just that information comes their way. They have the, and, and you know, there's gonna be opportunities. I, I think there's the Indo-Pacific Task Force of the Resources Committee is planning a trip. They're coming out here. So that's an opportunity to uh, make uh, sentiments known. I agree. Thank you. I very much agree. And again, thank you to everyone. And thank you to my colleagues again for your work on this and to my staff. And to all of you for all of the work that you've done and, and uh, please, uh, all suggestions are welcome as to how we can continue to inform our community and develop a one unified strategy in response to this. This uh, hearing is concluded. It is 8.45.